Yo, long hairs! Welcome to episode ninety-seven of Let It Ride, where we talk long hair and business, advocate for hair equality, mm-hmm. and celebrate men's long manes with hair whips and high, high fives. fives. If you're a guy with long hair, welcome home. My name is El Spencerino, and I'm here at the Long Hairs Global HQ with El Moreno and yeah. El Rubio. Yeah. We have a very exciting show for you today. But before we get into that, this episode is sponsored by Hair Ties for Guys, the finest hair ties in the world, which hold your hair snugly without creasing, tugging, ripping, breaking, or otherwise mutilating your beautiful, precious hair. Stop using cheap, crummy hair ties that snap and rip your hair out. Yeah. Tie up your locks with Hair Ties for Guys just once, and we promise you will be a believer. You can find these and other superior products for men with long hair at www.thelonghairs.us. Now, the moment you've been waiting for. Our guest today is a man that has served several tours of duty overseas in the United States military. He is quick with a joke or to light up your smoke and even quicker with a gun. He looks like Jason Momoa if Jason Momoa were to step up his gym game. My friends, I am pleased to introduce Jose El Sicario Mejia. Oh. Welcome to the show, my brother. Yeah. Audio. Yes. What's up, bro? <laughs> I just want to add, that's the first time I'm actually hearing my L name. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> I told him about it just dude. before we started. I'm like, dude, I want you to know uh, it fucking fits, by that's the way, dope, too. Man. That's Rolls dope. off the tongue. It that's does. Heavy. El Sicario. Yeah. <laughs> Full yes. send. Full send so, on um, Now, Jose and I, for those of you who didn't hear about uh, us on the previous podcast, he and I met at a photo shoot. Uh, a little over a month ago, and he and I were able to get to know each other very, very well. But I think for the rest of us out there, tell us about yourself. Where are you from, and which branch did you serve in, and what was your MOS? So I'm from Chula Vista, which is where we're sitting right now. South Bay? Oh, yeah, South oh, Bay all day. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I was born and raised here, and... Uh, you know, I'm just a typical San Diego kid. Yeah. Uh, funny thing though, I didn't actually appreciate living here mm. until I like joined the military and left. And yeah. Then when I ended up somewhere that's like definitely not here, <laughs> I was like, man, like I want to go back. Like, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know? Right. Dude. I was so excited. Like, oh, I can't get wait to. I can't wait to get out of here, man. And, and, yeah. and uh, now it's like, no, no, I can't wait to go home. Yeah. Like this is home. Yeah. But uh, so uh. Yeah, born and raised, did the whole childhood and teenage years here. And then uh, I joined the Marine Corps right out of high school. Who up? And, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of that was just like, I was kind of like, a, I was the runt of my family, which might be hard to believe. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was a late, yes. let's say I was a late bloomer. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yes. And so I really grew, like, in that last couple years. I had, like, this huge growth spurt. Uh, and so I was, like, really insecure and, like, unsure of myself and, mm. I thought I needed to prove ev- to everybody like I was tough, and and I also always admired the military because my my grandfather, uh, where I get my island jeans from, he's ch- he's ch- a Chamorro man, mm. and uh, he joined the Navy, and that's a whole another story. Which what inspired him to join the Navy? It's actually pretty deep, mm. but um, but anyway, so I always grew up like wanting to be a sailor or mm. something, mm-hmm. and then uh, I grew up watching, uh, you know, because we went to Afghanistan in '01, and then we went to Iraq in '03, and. That's a whole nother conversation about whatever politics, but mm. um, but uh, anyway, you know, I would like run home and like to turn on the TV and like look at like what's going on over there, mm. and um, I don't know, I don't know if maybe you know, uh, like a lot of island cultures talk about like like uh, the warrior spirit, and 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 if you look at like like the Maori or or, mm-hmm. or even Polynesian, they do the haka, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, oh mm-hmm. my god, bro! And I, I if I watch a haka, I sweat. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, feel, I think that I was born with like a warrior spirit. Mm. And so part of me was like, I got to go do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and so, um, I, I, I enlisted and initially I actually wanted to be in the Navy cause I was kind of scared still. I was like, Marines kind of scared me. Mm. And then, uh, and they should. Yeah. <laughs> and so my parents refused to take me to the recruiter. So I got my best friend at the time to drive me. And then, like, we're in the parking lot. Uh, it's actually the re- where the recruiter used to be right off of A, St- a Street. Yeah. You know what I'm talking right about? Right here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so I was walking up, and I was trying to, like, go to the Navy office. And then um, this Marine Corps staff sergeant comes out to smoke a cigarette. And mm. he's in full just dress blues, <laughs> ribbons, 
uh, medals, dude. And I'm just like, oh, man. Like, and I tried to, like, not look at him. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was raised to have mm. respect. So I said, oh, you know, good morning, sir. And he's like, oh, what's up, man? And so I went and I, I tried to pull on the, the door to the, na- the recruiter's office for the Navy. And it was locked. Yeah. And he's mm. like, they're not there, huh? And I was like, no, sir, they're not. He's like, yeah, those lazy bastards are always late. <laughs> he's like, you look, he's like, you like to be on time, huh? And I was like, yes, you know, yes, sir. It's, it's, it's what that's like respectful. And he's like, cool. And then, and then he's like, come and talk to me for a second. And that was it. No, I looked at him, dude. And this guy was just like hard as woodpecker lips. Like, yeah. just, you know what I mean? Like multiple tours and mm. just a dude, just, you know, I mean, like cut from granite and like, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and that was it. That's it. Like he got the hooks in me, man. And then like I enlisted, and uh, so that, uh, not that day. You didn't sign that day. No, not that day. But, but like that you were was, in. You were. That was that's it, dude. I deal. wasn't. Well, I wasn't gonna go anywhere else. Yeah. I was like, I want to look like him. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I went through the enlistment process, and uh, my recruiter. So he was the senior recruiter, but my actual recruiter, who was assigned to me, was uh, an infantryman. He was a mortarman. So that's called mm-hmm. an O three forty one, right? And uh, and so. I got lucky because he could see that I had that like angst in me. Like I need to go fight. I need to prove myself. Right. And once again, as I said before, I thought I had to prove to everybody else that I was tough. And so, um, I enlisted and, uh, I just wanted to be in the infantry, just regular O three eleven riflemen. I just want to go fight and, ground pounders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, I got really lucky because there was a slot open to go try to be what's called an 0321 a reconnaissance marine and to be honest i'd only ever really heard of like recon in passing because mm. it's one it's like not really talked about very much everybody knows about the seals everybody yeah, knows seals about special and forces, rangers, rangers, rangers and, all and, and, that. and we have especially today with hollywood and video games we have yeah. like this boner for special operations guys yes and, <laughs> yes and, we do and it's funny because <laughs> a little known secret well not a secret but something that a lot of people don't realize is like those guys they're super trained super proficient like they do crazy stuff but if you just want to fight you need to be in the infantry Mm. that's Mm. what the the only purpose that the infantry serves is to fight that's Mm. it Mm. like uh do you guys know who miyamoto masashi was sounds familiar but uh so he's the most legendary japanese swordsman Mm. okay and he pioneered fighting with two katanas at once so and the guy he, you don't want to mess yeah. with. Yeah. And, and he wrote all these doctrines and, and he left behind this legacy that lasts t- till today, right? And so he has a saying, he has many sayings, but one the one that resonates with me it says, uh, the only reason a warrior trains is to fight. And the only reason a warrior fights is to win. Uh, mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm, yeah. And that's like the life of the rifleman. Is like Man. you exist for one purpose, it's to crush the enemy. Mm. You know, whether you're a rifleman, a machine gunner, a mortarman, a sniper, whatever. And that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and then I found out, like, oh, you can actually you can actually take this chance to be a recon- reconnaissance marine. It's like, well, pff, what is that? I, I even asked him, like, what, yeah. what does that mean? Uh-huh. You know, he's like, well, I said, like, well, I go fight. He's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <guy. laughs> and I was like, all right, I'll do that. And I was like, is it hard? Like, yeah. you know, what I, mean? <laughs> like, I was like this 18 year old kid. Right. And yeah. he's like. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's, it's it's hard. And I was like, okay. Because right, I just yeah. want to make sure it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to be <laughs> checked. Check. Yeah, you're good. You're good. And so, um, and so I, I was like, cool, I'll do that. Right. So then I did, you know, boot camp, infantry school. And then I showed up to reconnaissance training company. And this was in 2009 when all this mm-hmm. happened. And, uh, and dude, hard was not the right word. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, Dude, there's a there needs to be another word that describes what that experience was because hard is not sufficient. Uh, it hellacious, was, I dude. Mean. I think about going through the training to become a Rakondo, and it's like I would rather be in gunfights than do that shit again. Wow, really? It's, yeah, Speaks it's volumes because they're the reconnaissance Marines are the guys that, like you know, the Marine Corps kind of has that like mythos of like mm. oh, marine sure yeah because mm-hmm. if someone says oh i was in the marine corps you don't think like oh that's cool were you like a clerk typist or? you're right no 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 <laughs> no oh shit bro yeah. like you were in the marines yeah dude? like that's 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 just what the it's marine every marine is combat. a badass like right. you know yeah. you're not but recondos, <laughs> no soft position, yeah you know? yeah recondos are the guys that like became marines and they're like that was cool but like what else you got yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. What, what else is, you know, <laughs> okay let me let me get some more out of this experience mm. and then, like pretty much like they're like 
sadomasochists and like i like pain and uh, i want to inflict pain <laughs> you on know? myself yeah and so um and it's just like i mean i remember day one you show up and like they literally like we're not getting out of this pool until half of you quit and so it's mm. like that's going to be two hours or six hours you guys get to decide <laughs> oh. and day then, one uh, day one uh, because they want to weed out the kids that like they're either the recruiter just hooked them up to get like their quota or yeah. they, they played too much call of duty and they thought it would, they thought it sounded cool. Yeah. And it's like, listen, man, th this is, this is the real deal. This is, this is like not a joke mm. and, and you're going to go down range, which means like you're going to deploy and it's going to be very real and mm. it's not call of duty. Mm. And so if you're here just because you think it sounds cool, this is not the place for you, mm. you know? And so they, uh, and so like, I think I started with, I don't know how many kids, but then by the time we actually got to, that was, we weren't even in the school yet. This was the pre, the prerequisite training to be qualified to go to the school. Wait, how, how long did the pool situation last? On day one? Um, <laughs> hour and a half. No, it was like four or five hours. <laughs> oh my day. gosh. Are you treading too? Yeah, that's or you're treading. Everything. All treading. different <laughs> stuff. Laps. Okay. Uh, Basically calisthenics in water. <laughs> they'll, they'll do. And, and, no air. And like I said, it's, it's not four hard hours. just to be hard. It's literally like we want, because they want to see how you're going to react when you when you're not winning mm -hmm. yeah because when you're gunfighting whatever and you're winning it that's you know you're doing that's a good easy. job because you're winning yeah but they want to know what happens when you're not in control when you're not winning mm -hmm. and because that's when dudes start to get hurt mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so um they'll do crazy things dude like you guys will tread in a circle and then they'll hand you a brick and all right pass the brick and you're treading what pass the brick yeah okay, okay here's two bricks here's three <laughs> bricks here's six bricks and then, okay, Damn. they'll throw a, a rubber rifle in the d and it goes down 15 feet and they'll be like, you, go. And then you pass your brick and they say, did I tell you to pass your brick? Take it with you. <laughs> and then you go down with your 10-pound brick and then you now you have this other this other thing and you have to like swim up with just your feet and just crazy stuff. That like if you're proficient, like if I do that to like a water polo guy, he'll yeah. probably figure Third it out. There are techniques. There yeah. is a way to do it. Mm -hmm. But Not like it when makes you're, it easy, but it makes it possible. Yeah, when you're 18 and like you miss your dog and, and, <laughs> and you're scared. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're about to drown. Yeah. You're like so, yeah. to drown in another five seconds. So, so – um, but so, that's what they want. Yeah. They and want so, you to pan to panic or to avoid panicking. Yeah, basically. exactly. Essentially, they want to make you panic and drown proof. Mm -hmm. And so, um, well, well, it's a little bit different now. Like, they've actually changed it, I think, for the better. It's it's a lot more um, um, science and, like, uh, efficient, science-based and efficient training. Uh, but back then, it was just brutality. <laughs> and <laughs> All and, goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, like, I, I'm not saying it was even a bad thing because – you know, I eventually deployed, which we'll get to, but like, and I got into some pretty hairy situations, but I never panicked. And mm -hmm. it's not cause like I'm a badass. It's because I was literally trained not to panic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, there's a saying, uh, you don't rise to the occasion. You fall to the level of your training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love so if, that. if you're not prepared and yeah. that's not gunfighting only that's business. You guys are business sure. men, mm -hmm. right? If you're getting overwhelmed and like, Oh my God, like our logistics is all jacked up. And, yeah. Oh crap. Like, COVID-19, our supply chain's <laughs> screwed. It's like, what are you going to do, panic? Or are you going to figure it out? Hey, dude, look, let's get to work, man. Let's figure mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and so um, uh, so while I was there, it's it called Reconnaissance Indoctrination Platoon or RIP. And then uh, and then they, R.I.P. Yeah. <laughs> Bro. And, then, and then they'll take the – so, like, by the time we were – by the time we were able to, like, take what's called the indoctrination to get into the schoolhouse, there was, like, 15 of us left. And Dang. then – Two of us didn't make it through that. So after all that, two guys still failed at the end. And then we got into the school and then uh, and then you just learn like it's so much, man, because you learn they turn you into a Marine commando pretty much. Mm -hmm. That's why they're called recondos or mm -hmm. reconnaissance mm -hmm. commandos. OK. And um, and so then you learn like guerrilla warfare, small unit tactics, camouflage, mm -hmm. like you learn how to build antennas, you learn radios, you mm -hmm. learn demolitions. You learn how to do like all kinds of crazy like secret squirrel stuff. Yeah. Do and you then, learn how to build a ghillie suit? Yes. No. Well, kind of. Okay. So um, ghillie suits are mainly for like snipers. Mm -hmm. um, but you do learn like more advanced camouflaging techniques. Mm -hmm. And then but the actual ghillie stuff, the, at least like I said, I went through it in 09, which is actually kind of a long time ago now. Mm. Um, so like 
Um, maybe they do it now, but while I was there, not really. Okay. Um, they teach you a little bit, but then it's kind of more like, hey, if you get to go to sniper school, this is what you're going to learn there. Mm. But you have so much to cover in three months that they're not going to waste their time with stuff that you don't need. Yeah. Right? Um, and then you learn a lot of amphibious stuff. So, like, you, everybody's seen, like, the Discovery Channel, like, Navy SEAL shows yes. where they're, like, carrying the Zodiacs and stuff. So, it's actually, like, a, a, a gentlemanly portrayal rivalry that we have with those oh, guys. Okay. Oh, okay. We actually train at the same place, too, over in Coronado. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny because you see them with their, like, rubber duckies running. And, like, we have Zodiacs, too, but ours are actually 100 pounds heavier. Really? Yes. And we're running right next to them. And even though they're heavier, our instructors are like, if those seals beat you, <laughs> no hell, shit. Hell, yeah. Hell to pay. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. And Maybe uh, take yeah. note, the Marines are beating you. <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, so I got through all that. I actually made it. And then um, I learned a lot about myself. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things I learned, way, like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I wasn't trying to prove to everyone else that I was tough. I was proving to myself. Yeah, because I I was that bullied, scrawny kid, and now it's like, who the, who the fuck are they, and who the fuck am I now? Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, and and uh, I mean, dude, to to get into gunfights, you that's you have to have some audacity, to be like that guy wants me to die for my country, but I'm gonna make him die for his country. Yeah, and that's like really morbid, right? Like overall, I I believe war is a terrible thing, and it should be an absolute last last resort, because human life is precious. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's a thing I did. And so that's why within the context of this conversation, I'm saying like, that's what it's like. Yeah. And so I did two deployments uh, to Afghanistan. I was I was at a second reconnaissance battalion, first and foremost. Um, And uh, so that's in uh, North Carolina. And that's when I left. Right. Because all that training I just talked about is here at Pendleton and at uh, Coronado. Okay. So then I was stationed in North Carolina and. I don't ever want to go back there. Yeah. <laughs> they have beaches and stuff, but it's not the same, dude. Yeah. And and it's like swampy and muggy and just, you know, mm. and it's just nothing compares to this place, dude. Can I ask a question real sure. quick before Send we it. get into the uh, like actual deployment and what it's like out there? Why is it uh, that kind of the Navy SEALs are like famous, I guess, and then the recon Marines are no one really like puts them in that same category? Yeah. So it's I, the name, dude. It, Seals, come on. Yeah. It, no, it's a yeah. good question. It's a great question. So, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say like, oh, we're just as good or better than Seals. Sure. Are. It's like comparing an apple to an orange. Every mm-hmm. every and, group has their purpose, right? right. They right. serve totally different missions if, and everything. If and being totally objective, right? Because I know a lot of Seals, and they're great dudes, mm-hmm. really solid dudes, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, but I think if I had to pick something. The Marine Corps has this um, identity crisis, I think, where the, the Marine Corps is not a military branch, by the way. It's a cult. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. it, like the Air Force is a corporation. <laughs> the Army and the Navy are military and the Marine Corps is a cult. Okay? <laughs> Let's be real. The Air Force is a country club. <laughs> yeah. And so um, the Marine Corps is like very adamant about not one person in the Marine Corps is special. Everyone's the same. That's why they say every Marine is a rifleman. But in reality, most Marines can't shoot worth a piss in the wind. <laughs> like, it is embarrassing because that's just not their job. They're a mechanic or they're, you know, they type, they do paychecks. Like, they're an accountant. They're an accountant, which is fine. We need those guys mm-hmm. because I don't want to do that shit, yeah. right? Those guys are necessary, mm-hmm. but in but they don't want anyone to be special. But in reality, recon Marines get special training, Right. We are technically a special operations force, right? Not at the same level as like some of these other units, right? And but because of that, for a long time, and like I said, it's actually getting a lot better now, which is great. I'm I'm and I'm not one of those like we didn't do that when I was in. Yeah, it's like, yeah. no, I'm glad. Like, yeah, I'm glad these guys are getting all that. But but anyway, um, the Marine Corps didn't want to treat Ricondo special, so then a lot of there was like we didn't get the same funding that SEALs get. We didn't okay. get the same attention that Rangers get. All that stuff, and so there was a lot of years, decades of just being held back mm. when they when they could be truly great mm. as a unit, mm. and um, and then because because of that, nobody really hears about Rakondos even today, right? Mm-hmm. But then you hear about SEALs and Rangers and yeah, and and all the other like tier one units and stuff. Um, so then that's why like SEALs, all, on, on top of being like spectacular war fighters, they're also like there, 
Like mm-hmm. people know they're there. They they know about them. They're on freaking Discovery Channel, right? Right. You know mm-hmm. stuff like Movies that. Movies are made. But about like, them. but like, if I tell someone like, "Oh, I was a reconnaissance guy," and they're like, "What? What's that?" It's like most people don't realize that's the yeah. special forces. Yeah, I mean, it's like on the lower end of the totem pole for special forces, but still, it is technically a special force, and and uh, and you do highly specialized training. You know, we have guys that go to Halo and and all the uh, advanced sniper courses and everything that those other guys do, we do it too, right? And I'm not saying that like, oh, I'm special too, boys, but it's like, no, they're they're capable war fighters. I mean, dude, you don't want to be on the business end of, of a reconnaissance team, dude. I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Um, I would not want to get on the wrong side of Jose. <laughs> no, <laughs> that man will turn my head Stay into on the a right canoe. Side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I do have one question about Send the it. training. Uh, a lot of these are super specialized. Some of them are highly technical or complex uh, training modules. Do, the, do some of them last one day and some of them last like a week? Like how long do some of these trainings last? And then I imagine if there's technical stuff, you have to have manuals or or books or stuff. Like yeah. So uh, how in depth are some of these has have to be? Yeah. So so like the stuff like the. Um, the reconnaissance course, it's called basic reconnaissance course because you're kind of covering as mo- like a lot of stuff in three months. But like like the first and like I said, was, this is the last time I'm going to say this. This was a long time ago and I'm sure the schoolhouse <laughs> is different now. But while I was there, the first month was all like field skills and like demolitions and stuff like that. So like you learn how to build what's called a hide site and you learn how to um, you learn advanced like camouflage stuff. You learn how to like different patrolling techniques like stuff that that of course like is that basic infantry guys will do but like not at the same level Mm -hmm. because an infantry squad might be 20 plus guys a reconnaissance team can be as little as four guys Mm. right in afghanistan my team was six dudes but then we always had a second team with us so then we were like 10 guys right my second deployment we were four guys wow yeah and and so That changes things, man, because if you have a dude go down and you're four man, you're a four man team, that's 25 percent of your manpower. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like the second month for us was um, the amphibious portion. And that's where you learn how to do all the like the water stuff and inserting with the boats at night and all the cool guy stuff. And Which you, is you learn how to how to use like the fins and the ocean. And yeah. And, um, and you might have this pack that weighs 120 pounds, but you know how to make it float. And so you literally are like. You have your pack and your rifle, and you're just finning, <laughs> and it's like pitch black, and you literally have people pass by on their boats and shit, no, and they have, they have yeah. no idea you're there. Nuts. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so it's wait, like a boogie board. <laughs> pause. Like, so yeah. do they teach you that once, and you have one night? All right, and you know how to do that? No, no. So it's like they have to keep rolling it. In they'll they'll cover the- it, yeah, and then like it's like for that whole month, you're covering these techniques, and then you go out and and do it and over and over and over, and they like they like beat it into you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and especially because if you don't become proficient, you're out, bro. Right? Yeah. So they're not holding your hand. It's like, hey, man, you know what, dude? Whatever it is you're deficient in, go to the supermarket and find it. But you're n- this isn't it for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and then when you get to your battalion, that's when you do the more like. More specialized. Yeah. So then you can go to like Scout Sniper Basic course. You can go to uh, Jump School, which is actually super easy. Um, but jump, then. Right. Yeah, you yeah. just jump out of a damn plane. Come the fucking plane even opens the parachute for you. So. <laughs> and so, but then, it's of course, part. after that, you can do like Halo, Hey Ho, like all that other stuff, the cool shit that you see, like the guys free falling in with their gear on. And yeah, stuff. yeah. And then, um, but see, like, there's there's like levels to everything because you can do like Scout Sniper Basic Course. And then after that, there's like Mountain Sniper and Urban Sniper and Recon. Now, there's, now they just started Reconnaissance Sniper and all this yeah. stuff. And mm. like, it gets really, really technical. Mm. Um, and then there's like signal courses like with radios and stuff Mm -hmm. and so it just gets like more and more specialized and all of these schoolhouses are like months long and they vary obviously but like like scout snipers several months uh but like jump basic jump school is like two three weeks three weeks i think um and then and then you just learn as much as you can because your team is so small Mm -hmm. that you have to be an asset and that's one of the things that i took with me in life is like if i walk into a room I need to bring something into that room. Sure. I, I don't want to be the guy. And f- I mean, first and foremost, I want to be the dumbest guy in the room because I want to learn. If I'm the smartest guy in the room, I'm not learning. Mm-hmm. In the wrong room. Right. Yeah, I'm in yeah. the wrong room. Yeah. But at the same time, like if I take on a mentor or something, I still need to do bring something to the table. I don't want to just be dead weight. And that's something I learned being a Rakondo. It's like, hey, dude, you earn your right to be on this team. Mm-hmm. You're not a, you're not given, hey, bro, you're going to be on with those guys. It's like, no, no, no. 
what are you going to do that's going to make you valuable to them? Mm. Because if it's nothing, then get the fuck out of here. You know? Yeah. Yeah. that's what they told me my first day on the job here, actually. Yeah, good. <laughs> it, I hope it was those exact words. It, it actually was, yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, so I, I finally I got through all the training, and then I did my first deployment um, to a place called Sangin Valley. Uh, this was in 2011. Um, my battalion actually went at the end of, like, it was like December of 2010, and um, but um, we had a guy that passed away, and so... I was sent to be as what's called his combat replacement. And so that was my first deployment. Like, and it was, I'm not gonna lie. It was kind of deep. Like, cause when you deploy as the big group, you know, like, Hey, we're going to a fucked up place. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not a whatever. I'm a fucking recondo. I'm, I know what I'm going here for. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's, but you know, like, Hey, I'm probably gonna get in some shit, but you don't know what kind of shit versus yeah. when you're deploying. I was literally one guy. And I was showing up and I knew, hey, I'm going because someone passed away and I'm yeah. replacing him. I know exactly where I'm going mm-hmm. and what I'm getting into. Mm-hmm. Right. right. <laughs> like, and so uh, I was there for five months and it was fucking just the Wild West, dude. Just mm-hmm. crazy. And in fact, um, unless it's changed, Sangin Valley is considered the most violent part of the whole Af- Afghanistan conflict. Really? Yeah. And it was it was just craziness. That's, dude. That's now, what was your mission too. there? Were you guys taking out some so uh targets yeah so we we were given what's called an ao um like an area of operation and um that was like a high traffic area for the taliban okay it was it was and i'm i'm really dumbing this down right but like essentially it it was our job to like to do to like um be like the biggest fucking thorn in their side as we could and like literally just crush everything that we could yeah uh, as far as the taliban was concerned um and and uh i know i just butchered that but like (laughs) essentially it was like hurt them hurt them more than they hurt us right your job was to smash or marginally disrupt yeah yeah and (laughs) and, uh and a lot of people don't even realize they think that we like went to afghanistan and i'm uh, trust me i'm a firm believer that we should never have been there as long as we have Uh, sure and i'm a big fan of pulling everything out now um but at the same time, I had a fucking job to well, do. Well, when you're there, it's your job, and that's what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, right. So they think that we, like, went to Afghanistan, and then these, like, poor Afghani people are like, what do you do? Oh, we got to defend ourselves, right? But no, like, there are two governments in Afghanistan. There's the government, and then there's the Taliban. Yeah. And so it was our job to crush the Taliban and help the actual supposedly democratic government, right? Um, and so that was our job. We I literally worked side by side with Afghani army guys. Yeah. It's not like the army was fighting against us we were fighting with them against against the taliban right (laughs) Mm -hmm. and so and then a lot of the most of the taliban that we encountered weren't even from afghanistan they were from pakistan right Mm, they were invaders too yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. right and so it gets it's so complicated plus afghanistan is is like it's like the place where empires go to die Mm -hmm. because it's it's inconquerable the no one's no one can conquer that place they those people are hard Mm. they their entire way of life it's honestly foundationally built on warfare, mm. even their tribal system. Because mm. you might have this guy and this guy, and they both look Afghani. They both are Afghani, but this guy's Pashtun and this guy's Dari, mm-hmm. and they will never get along. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And it's it's a it is a strange, it, at least to, to me in my American eyes, yeah. it is a strange way of life, dude. Right. Out there. And it's just wild. And um, anyway, so Sangin was a crazy, crazy experience, dude. And and anything i thought i knew about myself like that of course i had already done this like crazy training but it's just training right Mm -hmm. that is like okay there's no canopy dude there's no there's no safety net yeah right this is for real and you're either coming home or you're not yeah and and i think that when i came back from that experience that was like i was i was like now a man that was my baptism okay baptism by fire yeah for sure and then uh the next year i deployed again uh and i mainly worked in a place called nalzad um and that w- that was very violent as well but like not the same um and i i had a lot of very profound some good a lot of bad life experiences there too and i learned a lot about myself and um and then i got out right after that um i know i'm glancing over a lot of stuff but I could talk this whole podcast just about that. Yeah. Um, and, 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 uh, cause I do, I, I really want to get to my long hair journey, right? It's, yeah. it's very important to me. No, for sure. And, um, uh, and so dude, we're all ears though. Don't yeah. we're, we have yeah. no time, right there. We're okay. chilling. Yeah. We're, we're just hanging. cruising, yeah. dude. Yeah. Uh, and, 
Yeah. Wait, I, I I do have just a couple of questions. I think Chris maybe had a question too. You were kind of looking like you had something to something you wanted to ask. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Uh, okay. I think he is just in awe. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a dude, man. I'm just a normal dude. Okay, you say that. that. I don't, no, I'm a guy that did well, a cool thing. Man. What I wanted to yeah. ask was on that first deployment, you're yeah. the one guy going out, you're replacing the other guy. Did they just like, was it like, okay, boom, hit the ground running. Here's here's the team. Here's the, here's the mission. Here's what we're doing. And you're just out like next couple days or how yeah. does that kind of work? And then can you like walk us through some actual situations or like – you know, just maybe we understand. I think where we're kind of, we all have heard about stories and listened to other podcasts and stuff, but like, want to hear like when, what was the day when you're like, oh shit, like mm -hmm. this is uh holy shit. We're really fighting now. We're really, I'm like really in it. Your training's kicking in, you know? Yeah. So, so I had two days that kind of go hand in hand uh -huh. like that. The first day was. Um, I was still stateside at my unit, and I was in what's called a pre-sniper course. Uh -huh. So I wasn't in sniper school. I was training at my unit, um, th and the training is held by snipers that are from our unit. And it's like a two-week thing where essentially they put you through like a mini sniper course. And then if you pass that and you show like at least some modicum of proficiency, um, then you will become eligible to go to actual uh, scout sniper basic course. So that was because I didn't go on the deployment. It was like, okay, don't feel, what are you going to like not feel? You're going to feel sorry for yourself, bro. Like, no, keep training. Yeah. Like, let's yeah. go, dude. Mm -hmm. That way when the next one comes around, you're going to be indispensable. Right. Mm. And so, um, and the reason why I got left behind was because I was the most junior operator in my, you know, in the company. Uh, so the company was like a hundred dudes, right. And, or roughly. And, uh, they, that you can only you can't just take like as many guys as you want on a deployment you have to take a certain number of dudes okay and so because our company was over that number they had to start picking guys hey you, you you can't go you can't go and i was literally the guy with the least the most the least amount of experience mm. so you know i'm not even i wasn't even mad about it it's like no it makes sense yeah why, why totally. would they take me and i don't know shit versus <laughs> this guy who has experience yeah yeah you know and so i so then when they left i told myself hey i need to i need to keep learning so that next time, like a year from now or whatever, when we go again, gonna I'm going to be one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I got in this uh, pre-sniper and then I was doing that and then um, I passed the pre-sniper. Right. And so now, of course, the next step was to put my name in the ring. Throw, throw, what is that? throw my hat in the ring. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Throw my hat in the ring to go to sniper school. Yeah. And then I actually got what's called a nom, which means I got I got a school seat. Okay. And I'm going to go now. And um, and then I was at the barracks. And um, someone knocked on my door, and it was my buddy. And and he was like, "Hey, man, uh, Gunny, which means gunnery sergeant. Um, he was he's that's like the platoon non commissioned officer, right? He's like, "Hey, Gunny wants to see you at the at the at the office." And I was like, "Fuck," because normally that's like not good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that means you probably messed up or something, right? And so I was like, "Oh no!" Like, and I'm like, "Oh, like what did I do?" You know, like, oh, my God, like, I didn't turn something in. Like, I didn't turn one of my gear pieces in. Oh, I'm so in, I'm so much trouble. I'm like, I'm just, I'm like walking. I didn't even have a car. I'm like walking down this tank trail, like, to the office. Like, oh, like. And um, so I show up, and I'm walking through the, the this big, like, battalion headquarters. And, like, I'm going to the office. And then he comes out as I'm about to walk in. And he's like, oh, like, my last name is Mejia, right? So he's like, Mejia, I'm, I've, I've been looking for you. And I was like, yeah. oh, like, yes, gunnery sergeant. I'm like, and he said, hey. Uh, so at this point, the news of the Marine Sean Osterman that had yeah. passed away had already circulated back to the United States because, okay. of course, his family has to find out first and then everybody else finds out. OK, so at this point, everybody had found out already. And he said, hey, uh, so you're aware that, Aust uh, you know, Corporal Osterman passed away. And I said, you know, yes, Gunny. And uh, he said, well, you know, they need to replace they need a combat replacement. And since you were previously on that team. They they want they're calling you up, like your number came up okay. to go replace him. Yeah. And I was like, uh, like I I, I realized what was happening, but like yeah. at the same time I like didn't know what to say. Yeah. And he's like, but he's like, I know you have your sniper school seat, so he's like, right now, just between you and me. And my, mind you, that gunnery sergeants are like, I was a corporal at the time, so like he's way higher than me. Okay. And he has he and he was one of those like fucking like one of those like tough as woodpecker lips yeah. kind of guys yeah. and so he was normally like really hard dude yeah and this was one of those like he was kind of like 
yeah, being I, a more of like a mentor. Sure. So he said, right now, just between you and me, he's like, no one will ever know. Do you want to go to combat or do you want to go to sniper school? And I said, Gunny, I, there's no, this is not a question. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm going to Afghanistan. And he, and he and he fucking reached out and shook my hand, dude. No way. And I was just like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. And so, like, I like shook his hand, and that was it. And that was one of those like, oh shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to Afghanistan, dude. It just yeah, got yeah. real. And um, and so he's like, he's like, go back to your barracks room. He's like, I don't know, I don't know, like what the timeline's gonna be, but I'm gonna let first sergeant, which is like above him, know that you're going. And he's like, just start packing up. So the, and it's like fast, like this is happening. This Forty-eight is happening. hours, seventy-two hours. Well, it depends like, okay, because okay. they have to put you like on the flight, and then okay. there's a lot of there's a shitload of I mean, you're talking sure, about thousands sure. of guys. Yeah, yeah, logistics. Yeah. So because you're not just taking like a flight with just you on it. No, right, right, so right, right. They had to figure out how to get me on a flight okay. over there. Yeah. And then, so like from I went from like and I'm glancing over a lot of stuff right now, but like I went from like Cherry Point, North Carolina. I was at Lejeune, but the flight, the air station is Cherry Point, and um. So I went from like Cherry Point, North Carolina to to uh, Germany and then Germany to Kyrgyzstan or Kyr- Kyrgyzstan mm-hmm. and then from Kyrgyzstan to Afghanistan. And then there I had to link up with the the rear echelon for my battalion. And then they're like, OK, hey, hang out here for a couple of days and then we're, we're going to get you on a convoy, like a 12 hour convoy to go from Leatherneck to uh, this place called Favnole and then Favnole to you know, boom, and so it's wow. like just boom, 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 yeah. boom. Yeah, and then, uh, and the whole way, I'm just like, I don't know, what, I just anticipation, dude. Yeah, because I know I'm going to sing in Valley. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and so finally, I showed up to uh, a FOB is a forward operating base, so it's not like a huge place. It's kind of like an impromptu base. Yeah, yeah, and, like and temporary everything, yeah, right? Yeah, it's not like this massive fortress. Right, it's impenetrable, right? It's yeah. no, it's like it's it's big enough where like you have some modicum of security, but yeah. not big enough where the Taliban's like, I'm not fucking with that. Right. Like, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shoot an RPG at him, like yeah. fuck him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, and so uh, finally, I get to my fob, and and I, and like I said, I'm I'm what's called the boot, like just no experience, mm-hmm. you know, and these guys. Are like you can just see it in their faces. They're hard, dude. Like, yeah. and I knew all of them already. But like, okay. But like, uh, they had been in Sangin for a couple months already. They've been fighting. They just lost the guy. Like, yeah. It's it's this thing. Like, and and I had to like earn my place, and um, and so right away it's like, hey, dude, go do this. Go do that. Get get all your shit together. Yeah. And and then it's like, hey, we're we're gonna do a patrol in two days, or tomorrow, or like whatever. Yeah. You know? And and and. Total transparency because I I absolutely detest people that embellish their military service. I really didn't get along well with them at all. Yeah. Over the whole deployment, like really? literally, like two guys like me. Yeah. And there was a lot of miscommunication and a lot of resentment towards me and a lot of stuff. And like, it is neither here nor there, right? If you really want the like the real story, then you have to ask them, dude. And you know. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I was there. I did my fucking job, dude. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And um. And so, uh. I did my first op, uh, I don't know, I mean, this was like 10 years ago now, so maybe let's say like two days or three days later mm-hmm. after I got to the FOB, right? Dang. And uh, within the first 30 minutes of that op, a guy died. No way. And that was that was the next, like, fuck. Yeah, this yeah. This is real, dude. Yeah. Not one, even 30 minutes in. One of your guys. <laughs> one of my guys. Not and he was above me, but one sure, of my one of the guys on your team mm. passed away. His name was uh, Matthew DeYoung. Jeez. Yeah. Mm. And uh, that was just like fuck, man. It's real. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because I, I hadn't even been shot at yet. Right. And and he stepped on an IED, and that's how he passed away. But that's a whole nother like when someone's shooting at you, it's like all right, let's go, dude. Yeah, let's fucking yeah. go, bro. You know. But like, entirely different. But an right. idea is like they left that there. Who knows how long ago? They're sure. gone. Yeah, yeah. There's no one to shoot at. Yeah. You know, and so uh, that was like that big like, holy shit, dude, this is real. Yeah. And then the next day, I think we got into contact where we got into a gunfight, and that was like my first gunfight. And uh, and it was like, dude, it's happening. Yeah. You know, and then for the next like five ish months, because I showed up late, right? So the next like. Normally, Marine Corps deployments are seven months, mm-hmm. but I showed up late, so I was there for five months, and it was just gunfights after gunfights, just crazy shit, dude. 
and wow. and 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 um and it's just this crazy like almost like this primal like this is a, this is a level of humanity it is a human thing warfare because it's existed since the beginning of right. time they're finding 10,000 year old skeletons with arrowheads in their freaking bones yeah yeah and and i don't i don't like i said i don't idolize warfare right but but it is one of those things that we need to accept is to be human mm -hmm. is conflict yeah right and so it's this crazy primal thing dude like i don't even know that guy's name right I, he, he's trying to shoot me like okay. yeah all yeah. right dude let's go mm. yeah and um and uh when you're in a gunfight dude it is this crazy cocktail of hormones just adrenaline and testosterone and dude dopamine like crazy and wow. you don't feel pain yeah and it's literally like uh, when you get that fucking battle madness in you dude and mm. it's like i'm ready to go right now <laughs> you know what i'm saying wow and it's like this intense like i feel like my chamorro warrior ancestors <laughs> yeah. are like, a thousand years ago fucking whacking each other with <laughs> clubs made from palm trees yeah. <laughs> you know and it's like i f what that guy felt i'm feeling right fucking now dude yeah and wow. it's this crazy intense just there's nothing there's no experience in life that is the same it is mm. the most potent drug you could possibly imagine yeah and and wow. a lot of guys struggle dude after the fact because nothing makes you feel that way again mm. and that's why a lot of uh, service members will die like motorcycle crashes or like otherwise adrenaline seeking because they're going crazy on their so. bike or whatever it, dude it affects your body so harshly that they have service members that get out and their testosterone levels are so low that it, it's like they don't even produce testosterone anymore mm, wow uh, because of the crazy like cocktail that's like yeah. that battle madness cocktail yeah, dude, yeah. that happens in your body mm -hmm. and like you like guys are like like a like non-existent t levels and uh and there's never the there's again. this whole science about bl uh, what's called blast induced neurotrauma and i would i experienced that a lot so essentially explosions happen mm -hmm. and um the shock wave rattles your brain and it's like getting a concussion every time right and mm -hmm. um and so uh for example uh dr Bennett umalu who's the guy that uh broke the lid on the concussion thing for the nfl mm -hmm. yeah after the nfl he started studying veterans and he's he was finding guys that had cte that was so severe it was like they were professional football players wow yeah from blast waves blast waves Not even a physical yeah call, anything I mean. falling smashing your head on something um and like when i was in the Mar when i was in the marine corps i i got like six concussions Jesus. And one of them, wow. I lost consciousness. Yeah, man. And yeah. Was it was that actually from a blast wave, or did you? So the one I lost consciousness was not. Mm -hmm. um, we were in a on a, what's called a mounted patrol, so like in vehicles, mm -hmm. and um, we were taking contact. And the guy that was driving the truck I was in, he just gunned the gas. Yeah. I mean, what are you gonna do? You want to just sit there, right? Right, right. So he gunned the gas, and like I was uh, moving. I was in the turret, and I, I had a, an M240 Bravo in the turret. It's like a machine gun shoots big yeah. kind of bullets. Yeah. And um, so I'm like <laughs> trying to turn the the gun to like aim and then so like my attention was here and i didn't expect him to gun the gas like that so when he gunned it I, my head went back and i smashed my head against the steel panel behind mm, me shit. and then like i like leaned forward and then i remember waking up and like i'm leaning on my gun oh my god yeah and you had a helmet on too i had a helmet on yeah. but like those are those are like ballistic helmets they're not yeah, for blood okay. force trauma okay, yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah so anyway um I did those two deployments, and like I said, I could sit here and talk to you for hours about that alone, but like, um, I got out, I want to say, six months after my second deployment, mm -hmm. and then um, and then I struggled hard, dude, with post-traumatic stress and um, the whole, like, blast-induced trauma shit, yeah. and I gained 60 pounds. I couldn't get a j I literally, for a year, was unemployable. Like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't keep an appointment. Yeah. I could. I applied everywhere, dude. I got desperate. I was applying at like Walmart, and no, no shame to people that work at Walmart, but like, sure. like I, I had this vision of like, oh, I'll, I'll be, I'll go be like a cop, or I'll go, you know, do something. I'll go to college, right? But like, mm -hmm. to the point where like, I couldn't even get hired at like Seven Eleven, and and um, like my girlfriend dumped me and like all this stuff. I was just doing real bad, and then um, and then I kind of started to turn it around. I started losing weight. Uh, I applied to like SCPD and Chula Vista PD, and then and then finally San Diego Sheriff's picked me up. And so I was a deputy for two years, 
um, and that was good. Like it, it, it kind of got me back into this like re- regimen of yeah. like, discipline and, and whatever training. Um, and I really excelled as a deputy. I got awards. I was only there for two years. I got multiple awards. Yeah. Nice. Um, I, ha- I actually helped write new sheriff's department doctrine <laughs> as <laughs> a San Diego County sheriff. Yeah, San Diego County. Yeah. I worked at uh, yeah. I worked at George Bailey. Um, it's like right by the border, No Time Mesa. Okay. And um, I had a great experience. I met some really solid dudes. I also met a lot of shit bags. Yeah. And, and I, like I said, I'm all about total transparency. And, you know, as everyone listening to this knows, we do have some issues with law enforcement in the country. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those guys, like, I'm a neutral. I f- support law enforcement because I know there are really solid people that really want to do a good job and mm-hmm. protect their community. Mm-hmm. And it's a hard job, dude. It's sometimes it's an impossible situation yeah. and whatever decision they made, it was just going to end up bad. It's mm-hmm. always going bad. But yeah. there are some scumbags that are called bullies with badges mm-hmm. and they're just as corrupt as the gang members that they're arresting mm-hmm. and they're pieces of shit and they make everyone else look bad. And, yeah. I, and I think that you can't have, or I'm not saying you can't have one without the other way. Like we need the shitheads, but I'm saying you can't say they're all bad and you can't say they're all good. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You need yeah. to be logical um, about it. Yeah. And, and I have more comments about that, but no, that's not what we're here for. Right. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, one day I realized I'm kicking ass at this cop thing. I have, I've already gotten awards and I, you know, I like, I, I have friends here and I'm doing great, but I don't want to do this with my life. Yeah. Like, uh, this isn't fulfilling me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I, I had this desire to like be wild again. Okay. So, um, I, someone, let's say a uh, private military contracting company made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> really? Did they seek, how'd you, how they find I, you? I knew guys there. Oh, okay. And so one guy yeah, was like, one, no, <laughs> one guy was like, Hey man, you, I know you're not happy there. You need to come do this. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know, man, you know, yeah, like uh, retire, retirement. And, uh, right, and he's right. like, he's like, he's like, fuck retirement. <laughs> and, and then he's like, I know that you're not even going to make it that far. He's like, you hate it that bad. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you're right. You know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, so that company reached out to me and, you know, like I, I realized this is kind of like my chance to go and travel again and okay. kind of go to these places again and, and be kind of like in the wolf pack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for a couple years. Um, and that's, I wanted to grow my hair out, but I still wasn't quite ready for that yet. But I did start growing my beard out. Okay. And so my actual first long hair journey was from my face. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) There we go. Um, and then, um, after that, uh, so this is actually like where my long hair journey started. After that, I started working for a client here locally, still as a security contractor. And then, um, I, my first assignment was, um, I went with them to the Philippines to, um, cause they were shooting a documentary and once again, I'm not Filipino, I'm Chamorro, right? Uh, totally different culture. But, um, while I was there, I had these, like, uh, I just witnessed like the Philippine culture and these people and like a lot of them, you know, there is like bitter poverty and and a lot of issues with crime and stuff in some of these places. But a lot of them were just happy to just to be, Yeah, they were just happy to exist. Mm. And and they were such nice people and like this beautiful place and this beautiful culture. So colorful dude. And then, um, I, I was in a, I was in an Island called Palawan. And then in particular, there's a city called Puerto Princesa. And, uh, so that's where I, I I spent a month there doing security for this dock and then on my off time i actually rented a motorcycle and it's funny because like i had never even sat on a motorcycle before (laughs) but i learned how to ride it in like uh, one morning not well but i knew how to like ride it with confidence yeah yeah yeah. and uh so on my off time i would like explore the island and and go and check stuff out and then um one particular day and this is like a huge moment for me uh because um like I, i keep mentioning that i'm chamorro but i'm actually also mexican and, and I love my Mexican family. I love Mexican culture, right? But I was raised as a Mexican kid, right? Um, and I didn't really have this identity with, like, my Chamorro heritage. Okay. And so um, there, I'm not going to pronounce it well. In fact, I don't even really know how to say it. But, like, while I was in Puerto, they had this – was kind of what seemed like a county fair type thing. But it was it was like this huge celebration of like Philippine culture, and there was like food, and you could buy knickknacks and like all <laughs> these like boot, uh, boots that you can walk through and stuff. Yeah. And then they had this big uh, competition where all these like different dance companies would would do like a tr- like they would 
they did like this huge production to celebrate Philippine culture. And then yeah. each company had like a different thing. And then they would compete to see who had the best performance. Oh, nice. And then they would win like some, like a purse, maybe like 10,000 pesos or something like that, right? Mm, yeah. Not an actual purse, but I mean like a collection of money. <laughs> sure. Like, yeah. Uh, say in boxing, right? Yeah. And um, so I'm sitting there and I'm watching these performances. And I even took pictures of like my favorite one. And like, dude, I'm like on the verge of tears. Like, it was so beautiful to watch these people. And they were so proud of being Filipino. Yeah. Right? And these like amazing people. They're so happy, dude. And I felt like this spiritual like awakening, right? Mm. And like and, and like I said, I'm not Filipino, but like I felt like, man, this is something I want. I yeah. don't have this to, uh, of this island, this island culture. And so I just at that moment, I I walked away and I I was different. Really, I was, I was like I had a whole side of me that was just awake now. Yeah. And um, and so, uh, now we're tapping into like the island. Thing, yeah the hair and the, so the you start mouth, researching and start digging yeah. in yeah yeah mm. and so before i left the philippines i vowed to like become a chamorro person okay right? and not not to just say like oh i'm part chamorro you know my genes or whatever yeah what does like that mean and to celebrate being yeah. chamorro yeah right mm -hmm. and um and and uh so like i stopped i stopped cutting my hair uh as part of it okay and uh and of course not every Chamorro has long hair, right? Because Chamorro, just, like, just the ones that matter. Yeah. Um, so Chamorro <laughs> people come from what's known as Guam, but in reality, the island is called Guahan. Okay. And uh, the island, and I'm, I am not the, 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 I'm not the person to give like the in-depth history of the Chamorro people, but like I said, I'm, I'm. For anyone listening, that's I'm sure people are like screaming at them, you know, <laughs> that's not what it means. Right. Like and it's like, listen, man, like I'm still learning. Sure. I'm still healing like my tomorrow, my tomorrow spirit. Like, yeah. yeah. Before. And so I'm going to get stuff wrong, but I'm on this journey to get it right. And that's you know? what matters. Yeah. And so so um, I started learning about my culture and and uh, and I knew I did actually know a lot of stuff already because, like I said, I, I my grandpa. Right. Um, I got to learn a lot about him and like. um so Guam or Guahan has uh, continuously been raped and pillaged by various cultures over hundreds and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, like it was a Spanish slave port okay. way back in the day. Um, and then the Spanish like mission went there and um, con there was there's two essentially back, especially I'm, I don't know if it's as prominent now, but like there were essentially two uh, castes of Chamorro people. Right. Um, there was like the high society and the low society. I think a lot of it had to do with like land ownership. Okay. Um, so what the mission did, which is actually a common tactic in a, a lot of places in the world where they did this is they went after the lower castes and converted them to Catholicism. And then that spread. Uh, and then it eventually like two more people became like very Catholic. Okay. And, um, a lot of the culture was kind of lost that way. And then, for example, if you hear someone speak in Chamorro, a lot of some of the words are Spanish. They're not even like indigenous words, um, which is fine. Like it's our culture, man. That's our history. Yeah. And um, but after and then like now fast forward, like another major event was the Jap the imperial Jap the imperial Japanese military invaded the island and rounded up all the Chamorros and put them in concentration camps and like cut people's hair off, yeah. beheaded people, raped people like genocide mm. and my grandfather was an eight-year-old little boy in one of those camps no and he way. witnessed all that shit dude mm. and he never shit. talked about it until like a year before he died wow yeah no way. and uh and um after that of course guam was one of the first islands that the marine corps hit to take back mm -hmm. and um i find myself in this dichotomy because i'm a marine i'm also chamorro mm -hmm. right and so the way that the Marines taken the island was sold was like, oh, we're liberating the Chamorro people and, and, and getting the, these pesky Japanese uh, tyrants out. Right. And yeah. of course, like Japan is not that Japan anymore. Right. right, right but like right. that version of the Japan, Japanese mm -hmm, military. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so that's how it was sold. And that's how I learned it when I was little. Yeah. And only until I was an adult did I learn they didn't give a shit about the Chamorro people. They wanted the island because mm -hmm. it was a strategic place to put a landing strip for bombers to take off and hit the other mm -hmm. islands. Right. And um, so these 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 Chamorro people, like, they just got done getting massacred, right? To the point where, like, when the Japanese were losing the island, 
they started executing the Chamorros because they didn't want to surrender their prisoners to the Americans. <sighs> yeah. Horrific. Horrific. Horrific, yeah. Horrific dude. Yes. And um, and this is like, like hearing about all that was like a different kind of pain, dude. Mm. And um, but then it doesn't get all bright and bright and shiny from there either because the U.S. government started annexing a lot of the ancestral land from these families that had been there since the beginning of time. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, and my family's one of those families. Um, they took a lot of our land, like the most of it actually, uh-huh. and um and put naval bases there to the, and they're still there they're, right. they're still taking it yeah and um mm-hmm. and then even like insulting where like the the land that they annexed they sold it off to private corporations oh uh, no so imagine you're this person with like little to no means right and you're supposed to be rich in land yeah and then you see your land being sold to like you know delta mm-hmm. airlines right right and they're making millions, maybe billions, and you're over here poor. Yeah. 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 And uh, so part of me was like, I need to, I need to be on the, uh, on, in the effort. I need to do something. Yeah. And part of that was, I need to get in touch with my Chamorro culture. And, and that's part of my long hair journey okay. is to become more in tune with my indigenous side. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that's a whole nother like man if anybody's interested dude if you're into like the social justice or just even political activism or anything look up the indigenous land rights dispute in on guahan yeah it's gonna blow your mind we'll are talk. you uh involved with that or is your family or have you so, been out there yeah so okay. my aunt was the um u.s attorney oh man auntie if i get this wrong i'm so sorry <laughs> she was the u.s attorney for micronesia and the mary or for the Micronesia and the Mariana Islands. So okay. she she worked under Bush. Okay. Or no, she worked, I think, Bush, Obama, and then briefly for Trump okay. as the representative for those islands. Yeah. And um, she's retired, and now she's one of the attorneys leading the charge to get our land back. Okay. And, and my family is very privileged and fortunate because we have this – badass yeah so a lot of people don't know she's in a place of power too she's yeah tomorrow culture is like matriarchal so like our women are fucking warriors dude yeah and she's one of those women that's like fuck you dude like and 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 the inspiration from that comes from my great grandma which was my grandfather's mother um it was her land Mm. that a lot of this was taken and um dude, dude it's been to the point where like they've sent bulldozers just showed up to her to the last little bit of property that she had yeah and they were like hey this is a notice to vacate we're bulldozing this because it's being sold she's like okay like baby on her hip and everything okay go ahead bulldoze it well you need to leave she's like no yeah go ahead Mm. if you want to bulldoze this shit you got to run me over Mm. (laughs) like that dude and um there's a huge effort um and the the local government is doing everything they can dude but like they're they're these little people yeah and then the federal government's putting this huge burden on them to figure it out and it's like but you're the one with the damn keys right hand them over Mm -hmm. right and like i said i'm not the point of authority for this (laughs) this is my as i'm educating myself this is my knowledge of the situation Mm. um so um when, when my grandfather passed away he left his inheritance of land to my mother and then one of his one of his other daughters okay my mother um she has a neurological disorder so she doesn't she doesn't have the fight in her to to spend the next 20 years or 30 years whatever her 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 uh, um whatever her responsibility would be to carry on this battle so she handed it to me and she said hey i want you to she because she knows i'm a fighter dude yeah you know yeah and and uh so she said i want you to take the torch Okay. And so okay. So then, um, I asked myself, what can I do that's not better, or I don't want to use a word like that, but what can I do to remember once again? What can I bring to this table? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, um, I'm actually working with a local um, cinematographer and a local, uh, actually, um, Elefante's on this project. Okay. Nice. Um, and then another guy, <laughs> uh, and we're kind of piecing together a documentary where okay. we're going to actually go to Guahan and show what's going on over there yeah and, and just because i think and th- like i said this is my limited opinion but i think that one of the biggest problems is that nobody knows this shit is happening right yeah because I mean, if issue. you look at these other political organizations they're everywhere yeah like the more prominent ones right 
they're a household name and you know hey this demographic of people is having issues with like law enforcement for example but because they became so loud and so undeniable that now everybody to the point where they're affecting policy and that's power dude yeah Mm -hmm. and i think that we need something like that because our problem might be smaller than like police brutality but if it's smaller that means it's easier to fix Mm. you know what i'm saying yeah and so so uh my big contribution hopefully will be uh, that documentary okay and just bring more eyes because when because we might be a hundred thousand people yeah right and and by the way uh Chamorro culture is is said to be like maybe one or two generations away from being gone wow and no and way. and so uh i'm not the guy that's like gonna fix it but i want to put one more thing sure. on the sure. table sure yeah that maybe someone can take that and do something great with it right dude hell and, yeah and uh so um yeah, that, that's that's part, that's that's how I started growing my hair was to get in touch with my Chamorro culture and and uh, and wow, what get a that big manna! What you know? a journey! Yeah, the <laughs> big man, big manna. Uh-huh. and what a journey that's taken you on! And now you're oh yeah, fighting and an activist for yeah. yeah. May I read something that I just looked up here? The Mar- Mariana. I just started without getting permission, so I'm <laughs> it's fine. The Mariana Islands, including Guam, are the ancestral homeland of the Chamorro people. Scientists have shown that Chamorros Chamorros have lived here for more than four thousand years, <sighs> sharing a unique and special relationship with the land and sea. Chamorro Chamorros are commonly referred to as Tau Tau Tano, which means people of the land. It is also a way of indicating that a person is native to these islands. Pretty mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, if you have any information, like links, anything like <clears> that, that you can send to me, I think we should try to include that in the blog post if people yeah. are interested. And, yeah, and, definitely. And, and, and uh, Islanders, not just Chamorros, but like Islanders in general, yeah. are traditionally long hairs. Yeah. Yes. It, that yes, is yes. one of the cultures where it is it is more, it is the norm right. to be a long hair. It's right. a mark of masculinity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Saw plenty of that in Hawaii for sure. Yeah. We need to introduce him to Ben. I think I think the two of them would get along. Oh yeah, well. yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. he's another Chamorro guy uh, that hangs out with Linz from time Dope. to time. Yeah, yeah. set it yeah. up. Mm-hmm. Set it up. Okay. So, one of the this this might be uh, breaking topic a little bit, but one of the things that I have found so respectable about Jose's character, you know, not just being able to uh, prevail over you know different trials and tribulations that he's faced with marine corps training with deployment with you know trying to raise awareness about the cause for for the chamorro people but one of the one of the really cool things that he did is he actually um rescued and essentially brought back to life a feral dog from afghanistan and brought it home Mm. um and i've seen pictures of this dog when he found it and i have met this dog uh, very, w- just a couple weeks ago, and it's a night and day <laughs> difference. It really is. And so, wow. what, what, uh, what, what made you want to help this particular dog out? Because I know that the feral dogs are. I mean, it's just the norm over there. But what stood out to you about this particular dog? Yeah. So, um, this was not when I was in the Marines, but when I was in Kandahar as a contractor. Okay. And um, so the the wait, place- how many times did you go back as a contractor? Um, so I went, um, I can't say a lot okay, uh, for like non-disclosure. Reasons, sure. Sure. But, um, the, pl- I went there to that region, let's say, um, five times. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but it's, it's not the same. Sure. It's, I mean, it's super dangerous, but yeah. like I was, I was in way more danger as a Rakondo. Okay. Um, but, uh. Is he doing those? Is he is he walking from the yeah squats? from the squats <laughs> from the yeah, squats? Yeah. Boys, if you're listening, <laughs> grow your hair, do some squats. Exactly. Okay? That's Get the legs beefy. Your testosterone right? will shoot up seven thousand percent. It yeah. will. Don't ask me how. It's science. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I went over there five times as a contractor, and um, so the last time I was over there. Um, 
of course, there was like so many feral dogs are everywhere. Yeah. Mm. But this and these aren't like normal, you know, little 45 pound dogs cruising around. No. Like these are big ass like wolf style dogs. These are dogs. Well, they're not like, wolf. Like they don't look like wolves. It's like big, almost like bear dogs. We don't have dogs like this here. No. Right. Like no, they no. just they don't exist here. Just if you're <laughs> if you're curious, just Google like Afghani dogs. OK. They're okay. fucking human. You, yeah. will, you will see. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Um, so. <laughs> um, there were so many feral dogs, but there was this one dog that I found that he was like so weak and like emaciated and just, just so pathetic. And I, I mean that not in a derogatory way, but just like, man, look at this little bastard. Like, like just, yeah, just, he got dealt a shitty hand, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I don't really believe in like pity, but yeah. mainly for like human beings Sure, where it's like, look, if you're having a hard time, man, like, dude, tell me how I can help you, but yeah. don't, don't just wallow in your Right. Shitty situation. Or do like, something let, about let's it. Let's do something. Like, let's yeah. go, dude. Yeah. yeah or yeah, just you know roll mean? over and die. Come let's on. go. Are you are you having money troubles, bro? Let's look up part time jobs. <laughs> We're gonna get you out. You yeah. Know what I'm saying. But yeah. Like, yeah. Don't just yeah. sit here and, and and whatever, right? But with this dog, I'm like, man, this poor little bastard. Like, and I could see that like, um, uh, he had been attacked by other dogs, and oh. he had actually been hurt by humans too. Um, one of the locals beat the shit out of him and oh. broke it, one of his ankles, and so his foot kind of healed crooked. Oh uh, no! And I just felt so bad for him, dude. Yeah. And and um, so, um, one of the policies while I was working there because we had um working dogs, and these working dogs are like so expensive, dude. They can like sniff for bombs. And yeah, yeah. Cell phones and crazy stuff. Yeah. Is uh, they said like, hey, you can't interact with any of the animals. Um, like nothing. And so I was like, okay, like whatever. But I felt bad for this guy. I'm like, what, what am I going to do? Because yeah. like, I love animals, dude. Mm-hmm. And um, I already have – I have three dogs now, including this one. Um, but I had one of my other dogs. It was also a rescue, and I just like rescuing animals. Like I don't buy puppies, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I like old, unwanted dogs. And so <laughs> – yeah, um, That's great. Yeah. And so uh, I was like, man, what am I going to do for this guy? So I was like, okay, what what could I get fired for? And it's like, just take it one step below that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, plausible deniability. Let me just bring him like some water. And okay. Cut the bottle open. And if he drinks it, I mean, hey. You know, yeah, right, yeah. Right? So he's kind of hanging around. He was, well, kept coming around you. He found, stuff. Well, he wasn't even mobile. He found this little spot. Because mind you, it's like 125 degrees out. And so he found this little spot where if he laid there, you know, for 13 hours, yeah. it was enough shade where he wouldn't die. Okay. And then, um, in the evening he would get up and like find some garbage or like a rat or something okay. to try to eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I started bringing him water. So at least he wouldn't die of dehydration. And then I started just bringing him like, I like literally I had to like walk by and just like, uh, like throw it out of my pocket yeah. and just like slap some like, yeah. Whatever. Just a little sly move. To yeah. Just, you know? <laughs> and like meat. maybe he'll eat it, you know, give him and, some Cheetos. Yeah. And then, um, so then, I, thanks. And then I went to like uh, a local bazaar and I bought him a steel bowl and I was like, okay, I've been getting away with it consistently. We're like, I'm probably safe. Yeah. Yeah. And so I bought him like a, like a steel bowl and then I would put like water in it or I would okay. put food and then I would fill it with water and yeah. I would just leave. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, he had severe mange. So none of the other dogs would come mess with him. Oh, they knew. Cause, Cause they're smart. <laughs> they know like, Hey, that yeah, was yeah. sick. Like, Hey, don't, don't, don't yeah, run that him. guy's going to get us sick. Like, yeah. and so he's um, got COVID. So then, <laughs> yeah, pretty much, dude. He's got SARS. Yeah. And so um, it got to the point where, like, now he could kind of walk around. And then it got to the point where he would come and wait for me at this one spot. But at, at, he never let me touch him because he because all the humans he'd ever met would yeah. beat the shit out of him. Yeah. He never wow. had an owner. He was like a wild birthed dog, <laughs> yeah. 100% feral. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so um, I, he would come and he would kind of, like, wait for me. And then I would like put his bowls down and then, like fill them. <laughs> yeah. And then I would like back off and yeah. then he would come and eat. And then he would eat where like he could kind of look at me. No so, way. Yeah. Mm, that's and so then, rad. And then, and then of course my time there was coming to an end. And so I was in this impossible situation. Like, what do I do about the dog? Yeah. Cause now he was like my little homie. Yeah. yeah. You know? And, and I, I'm, so, I love animals, dude. Like I'm, I have, I, I don't care if I'm like this war veteran. Like I love animals, dude. I'm so soft <laughs> for animals. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and so I was like, man, like, what is the most humane thing for me to do about this dog? Because if I just leave, he's going to either die of dehydration, right? Die of hunger. Someone's going to beat the shit out of him and kill him. Yeah. Like, do I, what would I want? I right. don't want any of those deaths. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know what? This is pretty morbid, but I think I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because. Why not put him out of his misery, because right? Because like, in, in my yeah. mind. 
that was the most humane thing I could do for him. Yeah. So that he wouldn't continue to suffer. And I'm, mm-hmm. what am I going to euthanize him, bro? Like, yeah, right. I have access to one instant <laughs> death. It's a gun. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, man, I don't want to, but like, I don't want to just leave him. To, he's going to come back and I'm not going to be there. And that's it. Like, now he's screwed. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, fine, I'm going to keep being good to him. And then on the last day, I'm going to shoot him. Okay. And, um, and then at one point, like, he finally, like, let me pet him. And I was like, oh, man, oh, great. <laughs> now, it's now, now, now what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, three days before I'm supposed to leave, I go out there. And one of my homies went with me, too. Yeah. And um, I'm feeding him like normal. And then a truck pulls up. And it's one of, the, like, the, let's say, like, the clients mm. that I was working for. Mm-hmm. And, and these are, like, government personnel, right? Okay. And in the truck was happened to be one of the people that's, like, she was uh, like a supervisor, let's say. Okay. And I knew I'm fucked. <laughs> she's she's All getting me fired. Against policy. And like, I'm right about to go home, so it's more like I'm not coming back. Right, right, I'm right. so screwed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, uh, and I told my buddy, like, don't worry, dude. I'll, I'll, I'll tell her you didn't even know not involved. what we were doing when I was bringing you here. You yeah, were just yeah. coming to back me up in case we get shot at. Right? <laughs> okay, and okay. So, and so she, they walk up, and then she, and she's one of those like, just like she was a hard woman sure because she worked you know you know with for uncle sam yeah it's yeah. like war zones mm-hmm. and she's like hey and i was like oh you know how you doing man and she's <laughs> like you're the guy that's been feeding this dog huh and i was like fuck <laughs> and i was like you know yes ma'am I, I i'm the one that's i've been bringing him food every day yeah and i was like and i was about to say like oh just me now not him <laughs> yeah. and she's like it's okay. I've already rescued like seven of these dogs. <laughs> <laughs> she was a softie so too. Wait, so yeah, she was, she was also a closeted softie. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, I've rescued yeah. like seven of these dogs. She's yeah. like, I have a whole pack of them at home. Oh, and I was my, like, God. God, oh my God. Dude. And so, and she's like, what do you like? What are your plans when you leave? And yeah. I was like, well, I mean, I'm gonna shoot him. Like what? What am I? What else? Yeah. I was planning on shooting him tomorrow. And she's and then she kind of looked at me like, "Oh, you freaking gunfighters!" Like, yeah. I just want to she's like, him. "Do you want to kill him or like, do you want to take him home?" And I'm like, "Is that even an option?" And she's yeah. Like, yeah. No. And, and then, so there's a there is a foundation. Um, I believe they're called Puppy Rescue Mission. Okay. And I encourage anyone to look them up, even if you don't want a dog, but you just want to kick them like twenty bucks or something. Yeah. Because they help people that find dogs over there, and they help them. Get them to no the way, States. that's yeah. so cool. And from all over the world, dude, Turkey, yeah, okay, like everywhere, yeah, M- yeah, Middle Eastern region, <laughs> I think Southeast Asia, even like all these places. And no they help, way. they help service members and government personnel get dogs, and yeah, animal, like cats, anything to, to the United States. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. check is, out, amazing. check out their website, puppyrescuemission.org. Okay, yeah, if you're and interested, in they're helping. on Instagram. They have all kinds of stuff. But um, soldiers saving puppies, puppies saving soldiers. Yeah. That is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is what we need for sure. And so, um, within days, they set up this campaign and and to raise like five grand because essentially, if like in some parts of the world, like the more westernized non-war zone places yeah it's literally like oh yeah we'll just get him in a a, a dog uh what's that called like a dog Ket- uh, kennel, or- kennel yeah yeah, yeah fostering and, um, program. and then when we raise the money we'll put him in a crate and then just get him on a flight okay, yeah. but i was in a war zone okay uh, <laughs> yeah and so they were like okay here's what's gonna happen mm. like on this day at this hour this dude is gonna show up in a red station wagon no and way. you're gonna put him in the back and he's gonna take off and then if once we raise the money, like oh he's gonna drive him to Kabul, and then once we raise the money, we'll get him in a crate, and then we'll bribe some airline worker to put him in the cargo space and fly him to Virginia. Yeah, no like that. way. So wow. I I bribed a whole shitload of people <laughs> to smuggle my dog from <laughs> Afghanistan to Turkey, Turkey to Frankfurt, and then Frankfurt to DC. Were you traveling with him no. or no? He was just no. unknown so where he was. We had to go separate. Okay. So it was more like I had to trust this system of people. Yeah. That, wow. Yeah. Did you meet up with the station wagon, red yeah, car guy? The whole thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and, yeah. And, and, so cool. Yeah. And I was like, man, like this is so like some Jason Bourne shit. Dude, and it's all for his up. dog, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And, um, so wait, when they're trying to raise the money, do they like tell your story and how you were feeding them, or how yeah, how so, do they do that whole? How does that all work? So from what I remember, I had to like um, kind of email somebody and then kind of write a statement about 
like the dog and how I met him and why he's important to me and why, okay. what's going to what's going to happen if we raise the money. Yeah. And so I said, like, you know, I, I told him everything I told you guys. And then I said, you know, I want I know I can't save them all, but I can save this one. Mm. Right. And and so I said, I, I, I live this beautiful Southern California life and I want to just give one of these animals a chance to be happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and so of course, like with that write up, like, um, so I, I, I got some people to pitch in and then, um, and then they made it public. And then I had like, you know, Midwestern grandmas that were like, Oh my God, like God bless you. And like, they, they gave like 20 bucks and, yeah, and yeah. we raised five grand like that, dude. No Inst- oh yeah. Like, <laughs> like 24 hours or something like that. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, um, when I came home from that was right when I came home and I started working for that local client mm. and then I, well, I was home for like, I was in Virginia and then Arizona for a week. And then I came home and I was only home. I was only in Chula Vista for six days and I had just gotten a new house. So I had to move from my old house to my new house in those six days <laughs> and then get ready to go on my next assignment, which was to the Philippines. Wow. And then I, and then <laughs> he was still traveling. And then when I came back from the Philippines, like, Two days later, he arrived at uh, the San Diego airport, and I picked him up. And that was uh, what a journey for him, yeah, being was passed three, around all these countries, all these people ago. in a. He'd probably never been in a uh, crate before. He had never or, been pet before, or indoors he had, even. Maybe. He had never yeah. been fed before. No, no one had ever been nice to him. Yeah, he had never had a home, right? Nothing. He was a. He was literally a feral dog, like an, a one hundred percent wild animal, like a wild. Yeah, it's a wild dog, and, and and we're three years in, and he still has that little bit of like hood in him. Uh, yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And and like and and like the one thing, one, so one of the funny things about dogs, <laughs> I don't, I I haven't seen a lot of wild dogs except for like the Middle East. But like one of the funny things about like Afghani dogs is that they are climbers because they're like there's a lot of mountains and stuff. Yeah, in yeah. So they'll climb. Yeah, and, and like. And like you'll literally find a dog like on a roof of a house, and you're like, "What the fuck? Like, <laughs> what are you a goat, dude?" No way, I'm, yeah. It's like much. my dog. He'll just climb shit, and then like I'll be like, "What? Like where is he?" Yeah. And like and then all of a sudden, like he's on top of like the tool shed, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and he's like looking down at me like, "Oh, you gonna feed me now or what?" Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Let's go, dude. I'm up here. Yeah. The ankle, yeah. the ankle's good. So it's never gonna be straight, but okay. like he's good. He can okay. run. And, okay, okay. And um, the mange cleared up, and now he has like this crazy coat, dude. Like no it's yeah, it's a, he's just thriving here. He's San thriving. Diego. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen the Never Ending Story, but Falcor, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's pretty much what he looks like now, man. No way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh and, um, wow. He's this big poofy, <laughs> yeah. super jolly dog now. Yeah, I've met him, and he—you would never think that he was this feral dog in the Middle East. Like he is—he's a sweet guy. I love that dog. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every child of the '90s, '80s wanted their own Falcor. Yeah. <laughs> Better believe we did. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Oh uh, man. So I know uh, before the I know we, if we're I'm not sure if we're running out of time here, but um, I know you had. There's no limit on this one. Fair enough. <laughs> Send well, it. I, I know we're going you five have, hours. We're guys. going deep, dude. Okay. We're going deep. All right. Brace yourselves, kids. The marathon has begun. I know you have a brand uh, that, due to the pandemic, was kind of put on hold. Uh, but essentially, what is the brand? What are you trying to do with it? So um, I have to say this to tell you that. Mm-hmm. Uh, my two best friends and I, they're, they're also over condos. Um, we for years because i i got out in 2013 so i've been out for what is that eight years now mm-hmm. and um excuse me so for years we kind of expressed our disdain for a lot of these veteran clothing brands mm-hmm. and like don't get me wrong man those guys put food on their table selling those clothes yeah right mm-hmm. so i'll never i'm never gonna knock a man for making money mm-hmm. or at least you know in a in a uh making good money not bad money but like um but i don't agree with a lot of it a lot of it's like kind of toxic and abrasive and it's just funny to be ignorant kind of stuff Mm. and i just i'm just that's just not me i'm Mm. not going to prevent them from doing it i'm just not going to partake in it sure and so i always felt why can't there be a veteran slash patriotic brand that's just chill Mm -hmm. 
it doesn't need M16s and screaming eagles and yeah. and 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 dick jokes on it. <laughs> so like if you think about like like Ruka for example, I love Ruka. Yeah. They're they're a say uh, what like a surf and skate brand and, right. and now they're like in jujitsu and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. But mm-hmm. like they're not like oh like hang ten bro like yeah. super in your face. It's like no, they're just dope clothes. Like right. I love their I love their clothes, man. Mm-hmm. Or like Live Fit is an it's yep. like a fitness brand. Yep. And it's a fitness brand, but it's not like stupid quotes and all this crazy shit. It's literally rise like, and grind. Yeah, it's just like chill, simple clothes for people that train. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to do something with a similar aesthetic. It's just chill, normal clothes for the normal vet or the normal patriotic person. There's no political affiliation, right? You just you love America, dude. Cool. Here's we a here's you. a here's a normal shirt you could just wear to work, and it doesn't have like like a dead terrorist on it or. <laughs> Yeah. Work. It doesn't have some innuendo. It's just something cool, you sure. know, something chill. And so that's we we spent a couple years working on that, and uh, we even worked with Elefante to make some ads and everything. Okay. And we had all these assets, and then we did a Kickstarter, and we raised just enough to get it off the ground. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. That's enough. Yeah. And it's it's enough. Like we're gonna launch, <clears throat> and uh, and then we we launched it January of 2020. Nice and then perfect timing, timing. great timing. (laughs) And uh, and then of course the lockdown happened, and then a lot of people lost their jobs, and so you know a lot of these companies weren't like making money, and we were at a point where we weren't dependent on the income from the brand. Yeah. So we had a meeting, and we said, "Hey, what do we want to do about this? Do we keep going, and we keep doing ad spend, and we keep doing you know all all the stuff you guys already know about? Yeah. Or it's all e-commerce, so we could just shut it off. And we're such a tiny, tiny, tiny group of guys. We're like not, we don't even exist. We're like a tick <laughs> on the back of the market, you know? Mm. And so it's like, honestly, we might save more money than we would potentially make if we just stopped. And so we just put it on hold. And so it was kind of a disastrous launch, if you will. Like, cause as you guys know, like you have to spend a lot of money, dude, to get something off the ground and you're going to make it back. But we didn't have the make it back time. We had the launch it and then two fucking bad time. Right. Um, and, and I still have that vision because especially like right now where like, uh, and I, I really don't want to talk about politics, but like you have this like, if, oh, I love America. Like, I'm a patriot. And, like, you're kind of considered part of this school. Mm. But, like, or, like, you don't like the current government or whatever. Yeah. And not, oh, well, you're on this team over here. And it's like, yeah, but both sides want the same thing. They want a good, inclusive, like, mm-hmm. beautiful America. Mm-hmm. Those Both of those people are patriots mm-hmm. in my mind, mm-hmm. right? Because a patriot is loyal to their people, not their government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not necessarily the government, let's say. Yeah. And so I still have a vision to do that. And I think that we need that. It's a common space. Like with long hairs, you don't ask like, who did you vote for? Or, you know, whatever. What's your favorite team? It's like, right. no, do you have long fucking hair? Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what your you're identity or your preferences are. It's like, you're a long hair. You're one of us. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. how I feel. I'm yeah. one of the team because I'm a long hair. Yeah, Absolutely. totally. And so that's what, that's kind of something that I was aiming for. But more like, do you love America? I don't give a shit what your I love sure. America looks like. Right, but right, do you right. love America? Mm-hmm. Or, or are you a veteran? Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what branch. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It just And that's what I wanted in like a chill, like not in your face aesthetic. Yeah, totally. And, uh, so it was called This American Blood. And, and we, we kind of shut everything down except for the Instagram. So there's not like a website to go to right now. But um, I'm a fucking fighter, dude. And I'm not going to give up. Okay. I'm, I'm waiting like like that Ricondo in me is like okay i don't have the numbers to just get in the market's face and like i'm taking over right it's like no i'm gonna tactically withdraw but i'm waiting okay i'm That's waiting the for that moro in you yeah <sighs> you became a Ricondo. <laughs> yeah it's also kind of serendipitous that i became an amphibious reconnaissance marine because like chamorro people are like people yeah. of the land and sea yeah you yeah, know? yeah. Yes. totally so it's like yes. fuck yeah dude absolutely but That's but awesome. yeah so we're 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 actually we've recently started kind of uh setting things in motion to kind of resuscitate it a little bit okay but but honestly i mean what a great um what a great uh learning experience to launch right before a pandemic absolutely and, yeah and it's a it's a hard lesson bro like who told you you're in t- you're going to be successful 
Mm. Who told you you're entitled yeah. mm-hmm. to succeed? You're not. Yeah. Nobody owes you shit, dude. And that was a that was a big reminder. Yeah. Of like, so what if you did all this work? Nobody cares. Mm-hmm. Not, not I don't mean like people. I mean like the universe. Yeah. yeah. You, you know you what's know? interesting about just the whole? I don't know what your following was looking like before, or what content you guys are putting out or anything. It's uh, I couldn't imagine just trying to like act, launch a product in January and then everything that happened that proceeded is like <laughs> insane. What we found though, and this comes with having our our audience, our platform, years of kind of building this community. You know, yeah. like last year was insane for our brand as mm-hmm. far as you know web traffic and the product we moved and the things we did and all this stuff like because so many more people were online and stuff too. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm like putting myself though in your guys' position, you just hit the, you're like so stoked and everything. And then all this huge unknown cloud comes in and there's not really that foundation of like the audience there to know like, Oh, we got, you know, 10,000 customers that are just, they'll help us get through this, you know, where like that's, that was something we feel super blessed about yeah. and why I think our business like su- survived and ended up thriving was, um, you know, we had that community intact and that's the foundation. And at the end of the day, that's, uh, you know, people were, were looking for entertainment. Yeah. They were looking for more knowledge about their hair. Mm-hmm. And we ended up having all the years of library, the greatest, library of hair content available is on our website Mm -hmm. and then we were able to capture so many new people so like those 360 something web pages that we have like all our blog posts you know individual links like those all helped so much Mm -hmm. last year where we never would have guessed like we always know our blogs are valuable but the surge of people who were online like instantly took up traffic and every single thing you know so like it's just crazy how that worked out. I couldn't imagine if we launched the long hairs in January, thinking back what it was like when we actually did launch it mm-hmm. and had our moms on the email list yes. and like a couple friends. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, know, that like, was the big thing. Is I felt like, <laughs> it, it, cause it's like playing poker. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, actually I should say this cautiously cause I'm not like an expert poker player, but you have to make a call based off of the cards in your hand. Yeah. Right. Sure. And, and, uh, and so with the information at hand, it was like, I think we should stop. Yeah. Cause we don't have the following. Yeah. We don't have the capital to just keep marketing. Sure. And keep making content. Yeah. In this drought. Um, had we launched maybe like two years prior to that. Yeah. Even if we had j- dude, even like 20 total different like, story. Yeah, for sure. And so in that moment, plus there were some <laughs> other things that I don't, I don't really want to, I don't really want to talk about just because I don't want to sound butthurt, mm-hmm. but like, uh, long, long, just little snippet. We were, uh, in talks with someone, let's say, we'll say like a business advisor uh-huh. and they were going to come on the team as a consultant. And I knew firsthand that they had experience with startups yeah and they gave us this crazy good deal of of like what it was going to cost us yeah, and yeah. then right before we launched they fucking pulled out really and our whole strategy was built around that person okay yeah you know sticking to their word yeah yeah and so they pulled out and that left us so exposed sure. of just, and then we literally had to scratch together a contingency plan um and and you know three inexperienced business guys like we just didn't have a good enough plan mm. and i'm not and and i'm taking ownership i believe in extreme ownership like by jocko willing jocko. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to jocko uh I actually san met, diego guy dude side note <laughs> i met him and his fucking arms dude his hand and his fo- when i shook his hand his arms are like medieval weapons <laughs> <laughs> i believe it like there's so much meat there i was like jesus man <laughs> But he's a cool dude. I mean, I don't know him. Sure. But, like, that interaction I had, I was like, wow, dude. Like, I, I really believe in him, what he teaches. Yeah. And also, I met him, and he's cool. So, yeah. you know, like, that so was a great not? experience. Yeah. yeah. Just but, as scary in person as you think it's going to be. Yeah. And so, I, thinking within extreme ownership, I, I realized I put 
all my ch- my eggs in that basket. Yeah. And then that person just kicked the fucking basket over, and I left myself exposed. I left my flank exposed. Sure. Because I just expected that this person yeah, yeah. was going to deliver. Right. And I that was my fault. It was my fault. Too much I, into that. Yeah. Okay. It was that was my it was on me, and so um, so essentially we fell right on our face and and we had ourselves to blame and so it's like okay pick up all the pieces let's go back to the workshop and okay. figure this shit out yeah and so um and so we're kind of we're kind of tiptoeing back into the pool right now but yeah as of right now it doesn't exist so. shifting the brand into a extreme long hair and beard brand <laughs> <laughs> moving into a new category yeah. <laughs> no dude uh seriously though your beard and hair i've been i'm yeah uh. you know, i'm, I'm wanting to ask you about this because sure. i think you actually have the longest beard and hair of any guest that well, we've ever had on the podcast i'll have you know i trimmed it just before coming here you did just a little tune so up just, just a little to bit. keep things it was getting, looking sharp like you know when they say oh you got a mountain man like no no this is groomed right here yeah yeah i had like i, I actually fanned it all the way out with my comb <laughs> yeah just to see like and it was like it was like this dude. <laughs> oh, man because my beard kind of curls in because of my hair it kind of like pushes yeah. it in okay but like when i combed it all the way out it was like it was like I don't know if the camera can see me, but like it was like this. Yeah. I was like, okay, that's Whoa. that's too much. That's like, <laughs> that's like Blackbeard style. Yeah. I gotta really. trim this a little bit. Yeah. So, dude, like, okay, I've I've had lo- well, a lot longer beard than this, but nothing as long as that ever. I mean, that is absolutely insane. And even at this length right here, the hair is constantly it's like Velcro it gets stuck in there and everything. I wonder when you get a little bit longer in the beard, is it almost more? Do you ever have any hair beard? tie-ups uh knots you know any issues with the uh no. disagreement the, <laughs> yeah exactly conflict <laughs> eventually <laughs> eventually um because like normally from my experience my hair doesn't get pushed from here okay. if i'm like doing if i'm on the phone or something it gets yeah. pushed from here okay so when my beard is now down here it's pushing against others, just strands of hair. Yeah. Versus like if it got pushed like and this. And your it has a little bounce. Your beard even has a little bounce. Yeah. With the, because because <laughs> like my beard, I mean, <laughs> genetics, right? Like just like with head hair, you have terminal growth. Yeah. You have thick hair. You have thin hair. You right. have, and, and there are some great products. Like I love the the serum, by the way. Awesome. Um, there you go. Um, and uh, you have products that can help with it, but you can only take it so far, right? Yeah. So for my, this is like not much longer than my terminal growth. Like my terminal growth is probably like right here. Okay. Um, and so like the center of my chest pretty much. Yeah. And, um, so at that kind of like, once again, on the head, you have that awkward stage where it gets cotton shit and, yeah. and, 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 you know, your long hair might get like Velcroed in, like you said, <laughs> but then once, once it gets to a certain point, it's like heavy enough. Yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. And long enough where like it's like a shield almost. Like okay. st- stuff stops getting caught in there. Yeah. It's actually really good for uh, um, like when I'm eating, and because like I'm not gonna wear a goddamn bib, guys. Like I'm, you know what I mean. I don't tuck my <laughs> no napkin in my yeah, shirt. Yeah. But like if I'm eating and like, something falls, yeah. it'll get caught in my beard yeah. and not on my shirt. Right. Like, yes. Dude. Nature. Totally. Bib. Yeah. Nice deflector. I'm there. a savage though, dude. I just I just grab my beard and like, <laughs> and like let's do it. What are you gonna waste those calories? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Those are gains. Fall out into the world. <laughs> gains, those are right gains, there. man. You gotta keep those. Totally. Mm-hmm. So what was harder? The beard awkward stage or the hair awkward stage? I would say the hair awkward stage was much harder okay. because there's just so much of it. Yeah. And versus the beard, it's like just just let it grow, you know, just ignore it. It's gonna get itchy. Whatever. Yeah. There's no like magic potion or pill or or magic device. I, I see so much garbage. Right. That like being Bro, sold on Instagram. Beard, yeah. Hair, now there's like what, this beard that little rubber thing. Fire. You know that little wheel thing. Yeah, you, like, yeah. That's rub like, on your that skin. little wheel with the spikes <laughs> on it. Oh, it it helps your follicles. And it's like no. Yeah. no. It's like it shows a guy who like has like no beard. And then he's rubbing that thing, and it's like, yeah. in two weeks, and look at this. And yeah, and, and, and like, what they don't tell you is that that's actually reversed. He, they just made him shave. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for the first one, yeah. <laughs> just let it grow. Be in patient. Two weeks, you can look like Grizzly Adams. <laughs> Be patient. I, the one thing I will say is worse about the awkward stage for your facial hair is that you can't just put a hat on it. Right, okay, it, it makes it sense. It might look kind of bad. Yeah. Like, this is very patchy when I'm starting. Uh, so like when I'm first growing it, it's like here and here and okay and it looks fills like in garbage. Uh-huh. Yeah, you just gotta let it go. Yeah, just be patient, man. 
Dang. Yeah. This guy's managing a lot of hair over here. I love hey, it. You have a glorious mane, by yeah, the yeah, way. Yeah, Right up there. This is my mana. Yeah. This is my big mana right here. Big big mana. Mana. The big, the big mana. mana. Dude, big coined it. Hey, love you, that. you talk about bringing something to the table. He, you know, you show up today. We're uh, debating what we should name our our island uh, influenced new hair ties designs and bam nailed with big yeah, mana so you bring man. something to the table man <laughs> absolutely yeah it's yeah. like it's like showing up to a dinner party maybe they don't want you to bring something bring a damn bottle of wine yeah exactly. do something don't yeah. be one of those don't be an savages. asshole all right wash some dishes <laughs> yeah exactly. don't be a savage that doesn't do anything and leaves all right <laughs> so it's like show up it's like hey I really like this product, uh, yeah. you know. Hey, what if you called it this? Yeah. Or, or whatever. Love that. Don't, I mean, don't give unsolicited advice, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I love the long hairs, man. Yeah. I am a long hair. It's Dude. not like, oh, like, I mean, who the fuck am I? What, what am I, like a sponsored <laughs> spokesman, bro? Like, I'm a guy that has long hair and I love the product. It's great. You know? So in the fact, serum's been good for the beard, too? Are you using it on just so the hair? Or what's the deal? I have a balm that I put in the beard. Okay. So I actually haven't put the serum on the beard because okay. I, I feel like it would be a little much sure uh i'm down to try though yeah, yeah well, I'll, no. I'll do it um, hey no but, pressure you know yeah. i'm just but wondering I, i've been putting it in my hair and it feels good man like <laughs> okay hair. yeah it's i've been i've been like what about it. washing and conditioning you use the same product for the hair and the beard or two different things two, two things okay um i actually use um a special not i'm not i don't mean special as in like there's something fancy in it i just use a specific actual beard wash and conditioner okay. and then i use a, spe- a shampoo do you think it's different i probably Between? not okay. honestly um but also i don't want um i don't want my beard and my hair to smell exactly the same okay <laughs> um fair enough i don't remember the brands either um i'm married and my wife is like super into like beauty products and, yeah and, and, and hair care and stuff like that. So I just tell her, like, hey, this is kind of what I want. Like, yeah. She's like, oh, yeah, man, try this shampoo. And, like, oh, and I'm like, okay. Yeah. She did a full in-depth mm-hmm. analysis, analysis yeah. Yeah. search. And she's got you reviews. covered. She, <laughs> yeah. She figured it out. Yeah. Big mana energy. Big mana Dude, energy. Dude, love it. Yeah. Love it. Cut, be, hey, the big mana and the uh, FOP from yesterday. Dude. Dude, we had another guy in here yesterday. uh and he, he his line was uh, FOP, bro, flow on point. Yeah. <laughs> He's all, dude, you guys got to start using it. FOP. Yeah. FOP. Right. Flows on point. That FOP life. <laughs> that FOP life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fopping hard. Fopping <laughs> hard, dude. <yeah. laughs> oh, we could, get, we could really a lot, leverage that. Big Mana is absolutely nailed yep. and yep. just it doesn't get better than so, that. So um, is this the first show since the mural? Yes. This, yes. Yes. So it is. I'm gonna turn the tables a little bit. <laughs> okay. What did it feel like when you guys heard about that? I, and for anyone that's listening that hasn't heard already, uh, fill them in with that. And yeah. Then, and then like, and then tell me like your reaction. Yeah. Go ahead, Haley. Why don't you kick this one off, huh, El Rubio? Well, shoot. <laughs> we just found out a couple days ago from our boy Jefferson J, who was strolling through Ocean Beach as he's apt to do. And he came across the exterior wall at Apple Tree <laughs> Supermarket where they were in the process of painting a two story, perhaps 25 foot tall. It's got to be like 30. Maybe 30 yeah, feet tall, 30 possibly, of Fernando yeah. Tatis Jr. <laughs> mm-hmm. of the photo that is depicted on the cover of MLB The Show 2021. Mm-hmm. And Jefferson starts talking to the guy and. They were near completion. He said, hey, if you look at the picture really closely, you'll see a wristband on his wrist. And it's on the cover. So you pretty much have to. Actually, yeah. I'm wearing that hair tie right And actually, now. the guy who owns the yeah. company just lives right up the street. And he pulls the hair tie out of his hair. And Fires it up to the... Fires it up to the guy who catches it. Paul Mena is the artist, by the way. And he was he was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get there. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm doing it. And long story short, Jefferson, with a little friendly comfortable influence from jefferson J, the <laughs> yeah. artist was keen to actually spray paint the hair tie on yeah. fernando yeah. tatis jr's wrist on the mural forever emblazoned in the annals of Oce- ocean beach history <laughs> yeah. from here forward yeah that's it's, dope dude yeah the feet just i don't know the, you got to start back to where how the hell do we even get hair ties into mlb's players wrists yeah. in live games yeah. Like that's really when when we started seeing I mean, we basically just 
sent blind packages for a while. Yeah. Then we got to connect with Matt Strom here. Mm-hmm. And he came on the podcast. He had a great time. He's all, he was down, you know, for everything. Uh, believer in the products too. He used the shampoo conditioner. Uh, one of my classic favorite MLB moments actually in, in long hair is Matt Strom just came off probably one of his better, best career games. And the next day he's off, you know, so he's in the bullpen and they're on TV. They do like, you know, in the MLB, they're like, they interview guys who are playing or in the bullpen, like during the game. Yeah. So they're interviewing Matt Strom and he's just at the bullpen. He's just in watching the, dugout. the game in or the, the dugout. dugout. Sorry. Right there, sorry. Like, yeah. He's in the almost dugout on the field. And he's just watching the game and they're asking him questions coming off this fire night. And, uh, they start, just, they get into the hair. They're like, hey, so what's up with the hair, Matt? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the flow is looking great, man. Yeah. And Matt just is like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I got to give props to these uh, local guys, the long hairs, hook oh, me yeah. up, coming off a fresh wash today with uh, their epic cleanse, ideal conditions. They're just down in Chula Vista and uh, they just got my main dialed. <laughs> like, oh yeah, totally. Just like to- seriously, it was amazing. That was one of my MLB highlights. The Tati stuff has been incredible. That he's just like we have this superstar on our team who all season last year wore his custom, you know, hair ties. We yeah. made him, and then this season he's kind of mixing it up. He's wearing the Ola Muchachos a lot. We got some new custom ones coming for you, Tati, so don't worry. Get you back on <laughs> board with that. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's really all of the things that have ever happened like this in our business's history, and it's not just these players. It, there's been a lot of things. It's just affirmations that we're doing something that people care about, that is is we're doing the right things, and it's not about – the product it's about what it all stands for right. and that community and the whole like these guys are just down because they're long hairs it's like yeah. exactly what you said like you're yeah. down because you're long hair you're in you're in yeah. the you're in the family you know like yeah. and it's anytime anybody with any cred or cloud or professional ability mm-hmm. uh mentions us or rocks it or whatever it's just like dude hell yeah you know, yeah. uh, it's one of many thousands of affirmations <laughs> yeah. that have come over the years. A bigger one and a, and a, you know, one that offered a lot of, you know, excitement and pump and stoke. Yeah. But it's one of many thousand in the very early affirmations were comments on our blog or even yeah. on our social media or we get five new subscribers to the email list. Just those little affirmations over time. It's just like weight, like weightlifting or really anything that's worth a damn is it comes over a long period of time from sustained and continuous <laughs> effort and energy. Yeah. Cont- and and just, intensity. And, and most of those <laughs> affirmations, usually they're they all full spectrum. Sometimes they're always super exciting, even if it's a comment on the blog. Yeah. And he and I might be the only two people to read that comment or whoever reads that blog post later on. But it was an affirmation like, dude, we're on the right track. Yeah. These guys are talking community. They're coming up with their own nicknames, their own things. Yeah. This is like this is in all these thousands of affirmations that have happened over time. This is one more, albeit like one of the most sick ones. <laughs> uh, yeah, this see one up is there on the sick. wall and it being an OB too, That's where forever, we have dude. roots yeah. and uh, our field offices are located, of course. <laughs> so. For me, I think one thing as I, I was really proud of of you guys, of you and Jefferson and Charlie, is that they they documented this whole thing. Uh, Jefferson's just on the fly ability to record himself, have that whole interaction with the guy. It would the video wouldn't have the IGTV video we dropped yesterday, kind of the documentary of the <laughs> our angle of the the uh, the mural. Like if he didn't do that video. It, it just teed it up so perfect. Like, he's just, they're just starting. He's walking down. It's Jefferson. Yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. He has the hair tie. Why does he even have the hair tie? <laughs> Why did I tell him a week earlier, he didn't even know that Tatis was on the cover or that our hair tie was on his wrist in that picture until like a week earlier. And then he described that he only had that hair tie in his wrist because he had to reach into the bucket and his last one that was sitting there because all the other ones were used or he lost them or whatever. Yeah. So there was a series of coincidences and events that led to him walking up to them and even knowing that that should be there. Yeah. And who knows, if it wasn't for Jefferson right there, 
the artist. I'd like to believe he was going to paint the hair tie on there no matter what, but sure as shit, Jefferson made sure that that yeah. hair tie was going to be yeah. on that mural. Yeah. And the artist could have left it out. Get. When you could've. have boots on the ground and you yeah. have guys out yeah. there yeah. looking out. Yeah. yeah. Operatives in the field. Operatives yeah. in the field. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, man. I mean, That's this so guy dope. has seen, uh, you know, Spencer Reno's been here on the team for not that long, but it feels like it's. We've, been here for years i'm that <laughs> much of a burden on these guys no no that's how much we love you and how much you we feel uh you know you're impacting the team but this guy gets to really see all the people from all over the country every day like literally read their names and their addresses mm-hmm. and you know i had did done that for years and gustavo's has done that for I mean, we all still do it we'll get in there but he's really the main man mm-hmm. putting out these orders right now at this moment as a fulfillment specialist and when you do it it's so weird i, I told him even when he started like hey look this job, like this, this position you have right now, it's like, it's pretty repetitive. It's, uh, you know, but one thing that's so fun about it is seeing where all these people are coming from. And it's like every one of those little ad- labels you print out, it's like, why did this guy decide to buy this? Like, yeah. why did he get three black ties and two Olo Machachos and a hair serum? You know, yeah. it's like, mm-hmm. what was he really thinking when he was on the website? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff is really fascinating. I think for all of us here, yeah. well, it's, you think, wow, this guy believes in it too, and it's it's every single name. Yeah. I have that same thought. Like, <laughs> who is this person? You know? <laughs> exactly. and, and some of them are coming from like obscure parts of the world. One of them was coming from Mauritius. <laughs> Most people don't even know where that is. It's an <laughs> island off the coast of Africa, but he knows who we are, and he likes our ties, and he Hell wants yeah. them. You know, we have a lot of people coming from Israel. I had another one in Palestine. You know, it's just. There's people all over the world that believe yeah. in this thing, and it's awesome. Yeah, uh, my, one of my one of my best friends, one of the guys I did business with. Yeah, um, he. Uh, I don't know how I noticed because he's not like on social media and stuff, but like, um, I think he saw a picture of me. Oh, you know what it is? One of my homies is uh, doing the Pacific Crest Trail right now. Okay. And yeah, actually, he just started his long hair journey. Yeah. And so I hadn't seen him in eight years. We were in the Marines together and I hadn't seen him since I got out. So I drove first. I saw him twice. I I drove to uh, Idlewild. And uh, if if you've never been there, it's gorgeous, man. My God, that place is beautiful, dude. I drove all the way out there to catch up with him. And then I bought him dinner or he bought me. I don't know, whatever. Somebody bought dinner for somebody. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, um, and so we just hung out and I hadn't seen him in so many years and it was like, like not like nothing. Like I saw him last week, yeah. you know? And, um, so I brought him hair ties and, uh, I had actually gotten one of the, not the head wrap, but one of the head bands. Yeah. Like the yeah. Yeah. Ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I said, Hey, look, your hair is like, like just under your ears. So here's this headband. Yeah. It'll keep the hair out of your face while you're hiking. <laughs> here's a hair tie. And well, here's two hair ties, and I don't remember which ones I gave him, but like, because I have a grip of them too. <laughs> like, I have so many now, um, but they're all like my children. It was like, which child do I give away? Like, oh my god! And so, you know, it's funny though is he had made a trail friend, uh-huh. and that guy was having dinner with us too, and his hair was he actually had long hair. Okay. And so I was like, I looked at him, and I was like, and I grabbed one of the hair ties and I threw it <laughs> Dude, at him. You need this. <laughs> You need this too, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I took a picture with him, and then I sent it to my two best friends because they, they obviously also served with him. Yeah. And um, and they were like, oh, man. And then my and then my homie, um, shout out to Iron Dan. Um, Iron Dan. So he was like, Dan, dude, your hair's getting long. And yeah. then he sent a picture of himself. He lives in uh, Waialua, okay. in Hawaii. Yeah. And so it's like him on the beach. Like, okay, bro. He's <laughs> fucking flexing on me, right? <laughs> and um, his hair is like at that same like oh, awkward no. stage yeah, yeah. and I was like oh dude you're growing your hair he's like yeah I'm, I'm actually thinking about just letting it grow he's like yeah. I've never had long hair <laughs> and so I was like Let it ride, oh yeah. well interesting <laughs> very interesting <laughs> so uh, and he just had a birthday so then what we did is um, me and then the third guy of our trio yeah um, his hair is short because he works for Uncle Sam yeah. he's, like, he's a loser I hope he listens to this <laughs> um, he uh, I told him hey why don't we hook him up with just a bunch of long because i they know about long hairs because i never shut up about it <laughs> and they also know oh, I've, thank I've, you i've thank done you, a couple you. of your guys's like shoots and stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and and um so i said why don't i you know dan's growing his hair out so why don't i why don't we send him like a long hair starter pack okay <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah and so i um i told him hey go on the website just pick out a pack of hair ties and a head wrap 
because yeah. he's like a super like fitness guy. So okay. you know, keep the hair out of his face, help with the sweat, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so he picked out the the gray one. What's the the gray head? Kentucky wrap? coal miner. Yeah, that one. Yeah. And then he picked out uh, some black ties. Nice. <laughs> and then I was like. That's great. Yeah. That's not good enough for me. <laughs> you need a little more spice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, spice it up. Spice it up. But, see, yeah. but the funny yeah. thing is, when I bought my first pack, this is like way before I met you guys, right? <laughs> um, I, I was just going to buy the black ties because I was still kind of like, eh, you sure. know. Uh-huh. And, I was, and then I like, I was like, what am I doing? Like, no. <laughs> so I, I, I bought the, uh, the, like the Celtic braid ones. Yeah, the Vikings. The Vikings. Vikings. Yeah. And then yeah. I, I bought the, um, it's like the psychedelic, what's that thing called? With the... the the kaleidoscope. Oh, the kaleidoscope. I bought those, yeah. and then I bought um, shit. I don't remember those. I bought three packs. Okay, and mm-hmm. then and then of course I've acquired like a yeah. bunch since then. <laughs> yeah, as you should. So, I threw in some island vibes. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. and then I got him a Pacific head wrap. Oh right? yeah. So he's just got sick. His, he's off. He's off to his first. Um, He's got his long hair starter pack, as I'm calling it. I love that. Uh, and I, I mailed them out actually a couple days ago. But. And we need to have, sell a kit on the site that's this. Dude, long, long hair starter, starter pack. Do it, pack, pack. dude. Do it. You heard Another it. You, you heard it here really first, people. To the table, sir. <laughs> My word. Leave yeah, a space brilliant. better than you found it. <laughs> but you did. Absolutely. Everyone listening, yeah. you know what? If you see garbage, pick it up. Yeah. Leave that place better than you found it. Totally you know love saying? that. Love that. Yeah. Mm. You know what? I. You know what's funny? You say that about the garbage thing. I have this like this subconscious thing happens to me sometimes where if I'm walking on the sidewalk or the beach or whatever, let's just use the beach as example. There's a piece of plastic and I like look at it and I'm like, I got to go pick that up, you know, yeah. but I might be with my kids. And I like, go to them and like, then I come back and I'm like, Hey, now I got, I got to get it. I'm, this is my last chance. I get it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I grab it. And I'm like, there's this part of my mind that says like, if I didn't grab that, something bad would have happened. That is actually <laughs> the textbook definition yeah. of obsessive compulsive disorder. But <laughs> really? no, I get it. it. Is. I get it because, it is. because like I have this, I do this morning walk, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like almost exactly one hour. Yeah. yeah. And I see so much garbage mm-hmm. because it's, it's by the, one of the malls. Yeah. Uh, you know where I live. So I think, you know where I live. Well, I haven't I been know. to your house, but I, I know the area, yeah. the area. And there's yeah, a mall yeah. over there. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's always like fast food wrappers, right. and other <laughs> garbage. Yeah. And like, I'm not one of those, like, this is my neighborhood yeah. kind of people, but, <laughs> but God damn it. But yeah. like, I literally feel like, oh man, like the earth, this yeah. is garbage, totally. you know? Mm-hmm. And, and there are actually trash bins kind of intermittently on this path yeah. that I take. Yeah. So like, I'll just pick up garbage and I make it part of my morning walk. Yeah. You know? And. I literally feel like if I leave that behind, like the earth is judging me. Right. You know, like I am this parasite. Bad karma coming. On the back of this beautiful creature. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm complicit in the garbage. Yeah. You know? So I have to pick it up. I I can't. You know what? That will literally ruin my day. You know what? You know what? I, I used to think I was so weird because I think the same thing. (laughs) But here's my fear of the bad thing that will happen. I will lose some of my gains from the gym. <laughs> oh, Specifically, man. I will tear a bicep if I don't pick up that litter. So it's like, okay, oh, God, I'm dear. sorry. Man. Hey, whatever you got to, you know. Look. It's good. It's all positive that they ha- the, at least the mind is doing that, you know. Absolutely. It yeah. com- all comes from a yeah. good place. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another, you know, the, the worst thing is litters. Probably the second worst thing is the people who just put their uh, shopping carts just like just any, leave them anywhere yeah up on the curb or anything yeah just just another I, one that really those me nuts. those people with dogs crap on your lawn oh that's the, i know you're playing your long term oh, plan on that one. Mm-hmm. people uh, that don't put their cart back are toilet people yeah mm-hmm. trash they're just they're like, just garbage how lazy are you they're just yeah, a bunch it's of all about you it's just like and then of course <laughs> you have like the virtue signaling like well what if I have a disability? And it's like, then I'm not talking about you. <laughs> yeah, okay? exactly. Yeah. But yeah. if you're an able-bodied person and you're just a lazy slug <laughs> yeah. and you can't walk 50 feet to put a cart back, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's like, you're disgusting. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Lazy yeah. slug. There's yeah. a, there's, mm-hmm. I believe in integrity. Yeah. And, and it's I, like, it's not your job. Them. They actually pay someone to grab those carts. Yeah. But like, Come you're on. such a slug and an inconvenience to everyone that like, Everyone else has to <laughs> park somewhere else because you left that damn cart there. Yeah, because you can't be bothered to put it back. Right? It's like, no, no. Yeah, thank you. and 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 this is coming from someone who actually worked at a grocery store when they were in high school. Um, if you don't put your grocery cart in the stall, you can go fuck yourself. <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> Dude, no, I'm providing a job for the guy who gets the job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's extra work. You are yeah. making yeah. extra work. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what yeah. I would Plenty say too if I was a slug. To do <laughs> Seriously. If I didn't have to go round up all the carts. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Dude, I gotta stock five shelves after I pick these carts. Yeah. My two. I'd rather just go straight to the stock. Yeah. My two favorite words are integrity and tenacity. Yeah. Mine integrity is shit. doing the right thing whether people will know about it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And the, that's why the the shopping cart thing is such a good example of that of because integrity. like yeah, look, you could just you can leave it there and no one's going to probably say anything to you. Yeah. yeah. Or you can go put it back, yeah. and still no one's going to say anything to yeah, you. Yeah, burn some calories. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you're well, going to spend like five calories putting it back. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Honestly, <laughs> most of you probably could use it. Use yeah, it. So. Integrity, <laughs> integrity is measured when no one is watching. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Exactly. Love that. Um, but I, you know, seriously, people pick up after <laughs> yourselves. Yeah, and it's like, do you think that that cart boy is like, you think he wants to just go? No. He's getting yeah. yelled at by Karen's yeah. and uh-huh. he's yeah. getting paid like twelve bucks an hour. Uh huh. Yeah. Like, listen, paid man, five back. Do then. that guy a favor. Put the damn card away. Yeah. Okay. And burn some calories and, and, and walk away knowing that you're a dude with or a person with yeah. integrity. Yeah. Fulfill right? the social contract more than anything. Yeah. yeah. Totally. You know? Yeah. The uh hey, I gotta I gotta give a shout out to a cart boy up in Bonita. A couple Send weekends it. ago. Uh, he's out there, he's getting the carts, you know, the cart guys, like, yeah, the, if they don't have to go collect all the random ones, yeah. they already got a pretty tough gig with the carts doing 50. They got, you know, some yeah. of them have a little automated, nice, nice ones. Like some guys Walmart, just have yeah. the rope and they're oh, just, yeah. Yeah. they're just sledding that, the uh-huh. whole yeah. 50 carts back, you know, yeah. Yeah. they're just yeah. like, and they're, it's a personal challenge too. Like, oh, I'll get five more fucking carts yeah. on this. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So mm-hmm. this, this dude is out there he's doing the carts he's uh all this stuff and he he has his mat you know he's probably like required to wear a mask or whatever mm-hmm. uh and but he has it down and he's just cheesing dude just smiling Hell yeah. to everyone yeah. and instantly like i park and i get out and this dude just comes up he's like what's up sir how you doing man i was like bro what's up dude it's so good to see your smile man and i just like cheesing back to him i told my kids wave at this dude this is a good guy right here uh-huh. you know and it was just like such a f- a breath of just amazing yeah. fresh air from this guy who's just an employee at this place not only doing his job, but putting out amazing positive energy yeah. into the whole parking complex. And I was like, I have not seen this for seriously, like right. oh, for a while. Mm-hmm. Like this just love mm-hmm. to yeah. just interact. Mm-hmm. And it was awesome. He it, probably it, it, just yeah. barely clocked in. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> but it's like, it's like bad brains, man. You got that PMA, positive mental attitude. Uh, yeah, for sure. totally. Yeah. And, and no, honest, he was feeding off it though. Yeah. You know, he was getting juice from yeah. like everybody else. And like. Yeah. Yeah, it was great, dude. It was great. Shout out Anymore. to the bag boys yeah. and Bonita. bag girls of America, man. <laughs> cart <laughs> guy. Appreciate the Bro. cart guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's the same job. Uh, you're bagging groceries and bringing in carts. Yeah. Yeah. And cleaning up the shitter. Yeah, cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Have I got stories for you. <laughs> oh, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. All right, dude. Guys, we are about to hit the two-hour mark wow, already, here. Huh? On the podcast, Ooh, no, um, no. is this yeah. the longest one ever? No, I think we had a two-hour one a couple. Oh, okay, I don't like being ago. second best, but okay. uh, one of the lounges. <laughs> <is> <laughs> two hours. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. I'm kidding. This I'm kidding. is certainly the one lounge. of the better ones. I will say, not that there are any that are shit, but this one was really interesting because, as I've been telling Rubio and Moreno, like I was like, we need we need to get this guy on here. He yeah. has got so much to give. Okay, I have a. a a kind of a final question on my end because it goes. It's kind of just been in my head since you've said it, and I think it can go along with just really a lot of the stuff we're talking about with uh, you know pulling yourself out, being someone who's going to give when they walk into a room. But you had mentioned earlier about you struggling with PTSD, gaining mm-hmm. sixty pounds, being lazy, whatever, making excuses, but then like f- you know then getting going, applying for all these jobs, getting some momentum. People coming out of this year, you know, maybe someone on this podcast can get inspired of like, what was it for you or how did you uh, change that mental mentality and how did you, you know, get yourself going and get over to the sheriffs and and how did you do it? Yeah, that's a loaded question. (laughs) You've opened Pandora's Um, box. Okay, so I think that. Do you guys know who Pat McNamara is? Yes. 
I don't know. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, look him up. He's a he's a freaking badass human being. Just okay. like if you like Jocko, Pat yeah, McNamara yeah. is like just a that is one bad man right okay. there. Okay. Okay. Um, and I didn't hear this phrase that I'm about to repeat from him when I was struggling, yeah. but it is a great way to describe how I got myself out of that situation. Okay. Pat McNamara also dealt with a lot of these issues and he did way more than I did in the military way like not even the same fucking sport okay um like I was playing peewee football and he was playing NFL okay okay um he said that he changed his life by having one good day at a time mm-hmm. and yeah. that's now that I look back that's how I did it too okay mm-hmm. and and I just decided I have a limited amount of time in this flesh existence and I need, you know what? I don't know about tomorrow. Okay. But today do some fucking sit ups or, you know, go get outside, get some fresh air. Yeah. Go apply to one more place. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But do something. Remember how I keep saying like, leave the, leave a space better than you found it. Yeah. Like do something to make yourself better today. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be because a lot of people, uh, think about the end game right Mm -hmm. and they say oh my god well uh, what's my goal i want to be a millionaire right well how do i make a million dollars so don't worry about making a million dollars can you make one (laughs) dollar yeah Mm -hmm. yeah right yeah uh um and so think of it in that context break down the battle into these micro encounters Mm. what can i do right now yeah okay you know what watch a youtube video how do you do that skill yeah Uh, one of my uh, one of my best friends um He's a data scientist now, and he learned how to code from YouTube. And then awesome. he just started enrolling himself in these like little online courses, uh, and yeah. now he does it for a living. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? One little battle at a time. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's it's literally like, dude, this is life. Yeah. And you're going to strike out, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. For sure. You're going to fail. Totally. You're going to have a hard time. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, there's like that stereotypical, like, well, you need the hard times to appreciate the good times. So of course. <laughs> Right. But like uh, uh, adversity introduces us to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Right. You'll never know what you're made of if it's all good. Mm-hmm. It has to be bad mm-hmm. sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And so I learned a lot about myself and all those crazy things I talked about already. And then uh, and I lost sight of it. Right. And of course, from time to time, we lose sight of it. And I'm going to lose sight of it again. Right. But it's it's. It's okay to be down, but it's not okay to stay down. Right. Right? Yeah. And so it's literally like, okay, man, I'm having a hard time. What can I do not to fix it right now, but what can I do just one more step, dude? Yeah. Right? Get a a little momentum going. Yeah. Get a little bit of momentum. Yeah. You know? Maybe I walk around the block. Cool. That's more exercise than I did yesterday. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Apply to one more job or whatever. Whatever your problem is, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And... Uh, just little like that. Focus on the small battles, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and um, you got to be patient. Mm-hmm. You have to, cause because we are these tiny little carbon life forms in this thing called the universe, mm-hmm. right? We're so microscopic, dude. We're yeah. less than microscopic, mm-hmm. and the universe has been here for billions of years, as far as we know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so. Your life is this little blip on this massive radar and you have to remember that it's not all about you. Mm -hmm. And if you can surrender yourself to the fact that ultimately you're not entirely in control and not to say like, oh, just give up and whatever happens, happens. But like to understand that things are going to happen that you didn't account for, i.e. the pandemic, Mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. You didn't account for that. Who the hell knew that the whole world was going to shut down? Right. But you, if you leave yourself open to say, hey, things are going to happen that I didn't see coming, then you're more flexible and fluid to just r- roll with the punches and adapt and say, okay, this is my new reality. What can I do to, to start fixing it? Yeah. Or to get around it or get over it or go through it. Totally. You know? Yeah. Um, And I say, like, that's, that's, that's it. That's a lot. Of, that's the majority of the battle, dude. Okay. You know, dude, great message. And, Love uh, it. One more thing, if you're out there and you're and you're and you're uh, you want to be a long hair or you're in that like, dude, I've had so many people tell me like, 
like, oh, when are you going to cut your hair? Like, when, uh, and, or joke about, like, my long hair. Or just straight up tell me, like, like what are you doing? Like, yeah. growing your hair out? And it's like, you got to remember, this standard of this grooming standard or like, oh, like, like literally where you have to ask an employer, like, what's your grooming standard? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know what, dude? I wasn't consulted when this standard was created. Were you? Were you? <laughs> yeah. Right. No. So yeah. who are you to tell me that this is unprofessional? You know what, dude? This takes more effort mm -hmm. to maintain mm -hmm. and yeah. be presentable than to just cut it off. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. The truth. And there are so many cultures like Chamorro people mm -hmm. that or na or other native cultures that our hair was cut off of us. Mm hmm. And that's mm. just another symbol of the oppressor mm. yeah. to tell me that I'm not allowed to look how I want. Yeah, yeah. Right? The so I tell people, like, dude, if you want to grow your hair out, grow that fucking hair out. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and, and uh, it's just an, it's another symbol. It's a resistance. Mm. Show them how we resist. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> I'm telling you, I fucking love this guy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, try smoking with him sometime. And it's just. I love. Just, oh, I'm good, brother. Thank you. Uh, I love cigars man okay big cigar guy big cigar guy yeah uh, and, and uh i know we're trying to wrap here but like dude the the cigars oh man and and, and <laughs> but what i love about it is is uh that you can get a guy and and over the course of that cigar you can just have this conversation that we had today yeah and that's what we need dude is more people to listen instead of talk yeah and just and reach out to someone and just what is that guy about dude because you never know that might be your best fucking friend but you might think he's your enemy right now love you know? that Case totally. Was like, I met at the photo shoot. I was like, "Who the hell is this yeah. douchebag?" Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, guys. This was a, this was a really great time, dude. Absolutely, man. Dude. Thank you for sharing your story, your deep insights, your experience on life, your hair journey, your cultural journey, just everything, dude. This is awesome, mm. and we're so stoked that you are uh, just riding on the on the train with the long hairs, baby. Uh -huh. In any way that. we can help you in. Uh, your your brand or or anything there you Dope. know is there what is the instagram how how could how could people follow you there and be ready for the relaunch yeah mm -hmm. so my instagram is uh tab underscore jose um i'm not even going to direct traffic to the the business because it's i don't want to send people to a dead end okay um so they can follow you on instagram though follow right me now. on ig yeah. and they'll, they'll find they'll out find when, out yeah, when, we're ready when to it's go, ready yeah. hell yeah yep. Well, dude, any closing uh, arguments, Spencer? <laughs> closing arguments? Uh, no, I just, as I say, uh, it, it was a pleasure to have you on the show, dude. Honestly, I'm so glad we were able to do this. Yeah. Um, the defense rests, Your Honor. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this guy, El Spencerino, and I have become very good friends. And dude, that's I great. Thank you guys for that. For yeah. Go follow on Instagram, tab underscore Jose. Most recent post featuring what appears to be 400. I know that one. 45 pound deadlift <laughs> or three reps with Spencer Reno in the background just pumping him on. <laughs> yes. Uh, pretty impressive there. At the gym, what, the new workout facility yeah. of the Long Hairs. The right. hottest place in the South Bay. You better believe it. <laughs> the only Who gym gains, worth gains, going gains. to in the South Bay. Uh, yeah. Just ask Gus. <laughs> <laughs> Gus hates our guts right now. He was Those there the day. Twig legs are just in <laughs> extreme pain Shaking. today. <laughs> good. That's good. I told that's, him just that's, trembling. That's the weakness vacating Stick your body. <laughs> Stick yeah. with us. We're going to make you look like machete. Okay? Machete. <laughs> yes, dude. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Yo, yes. long hairs. Thanks for tuning in. Kick-ass episode. We're at 97. Closing in, in on, on 100, 100 podcast oh, episodes. No. But uh, one of our just phenomenal guests. Thanks a lot for hanging, man. El Thanks. Cigario. Yes. 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 I got my extra El I'm in, dude. Heard, you definitely El got El Monaker, I'm in sure. like sin. I got my L name. It's no turning back now, dude. dude. No, no. Por vida. It's, por vida. It's, it's done. In for por life. For life. <laughs> <laughs> por vida, loco. Mm -hmm. All right, boys. Till next time. Sue. Sue. <laughs>